Hello and welcome. I'm Tina Dehealy and this is Lions Live, brought to you with our official streaming partner, YouTube. This edition of Lions Live is called the New Creators Toolkit and it's all about you. How you can become a better creative, how you can adapt your skills and capabilities for a new world order, and what's required to thrive now in a world beset with uncertainty. If the last two Lions Lives have taught us anything, it's that crises require creativity. And we're here this week to feed your imagination. We will have a live Q&A with our presenters every day, all powered by the brand building platform we transfer. To kick things off, please let me introduce the managing director of Lions, Simon Cook. Simon, the last time we saw you was way back in October. What's been happening at Lions since? Well, firstly, Tina, so sorry I can't be there in the studio with you this time, but we're in a, a lockdown, as you know. Next time we'll be reunited, I'm sure. So since last October, well, it's been a really interesting time, especially for the work. We know, as you said, that creativity really thrives in times of great constraint and limitation, and that's no exception for judging the work either. So since we last spoke, our sister awards, both in Europe uh, in Asia and also in MENA. Work has been judged, it's been awarded, it took place remotely, and it's good to see the return of the creative benchmark. And also some of the themes and trends emerging across the world during this very interesting time, the changing shape of creativity. And after the vacuum created last year, obviously we didn't have the awards at Can Lions, there seems to be a pent up demand for fresh insights and examples of best practice, and especially now. So looking forward to sharing some of those insights across the Lions platform over the coming months. And Simon, tell us a little bit more about this edition of Lions Live. Well, yeah, this one's a bit different. We've designed it slightly differently this time. It's designed to help anyone, as you say, who wants to sharpen their creative toolkit. So we know from our community that traditional curriculum and courses around creativity and branded communications set you up for success in a particular discipline or craft but it's often the intangible stuff isn't it that you know you don't get taught that is needed so we're going to explore things like creative leadership and curiosity critical thinking adaptability all the stuff that we need to be able to flex and add to our creative toolkit so this edition of Lions Live is designed to bring that insight, that inspiration, but as you say, the practical tools to progress through creativity. As you say, it's designed a bit differently to previous Lions Live. Could you tell us a bit more about the actual experience of this week? Yeah, so it's going to be a bit different for the audience as well, absolutely. Um, we know that people are stretched at the moment, they're time poor and they're in various states of lockdown, wherever they are in the world. So we've designed it so people can dip in and out as they choose. So we've reflected that in the design of the week. So okay. from Monday to Wednesday this week, you can tune in to the studio with you, Tina, to watch a series of films designed by our community to help sharpen the creative toolkit. And then on Thursday, we'll be running a day called What I've Learned. So popular workshops that people may have seen from previous Lions Live. Slightly different this time, much more interactive and a chance to get more involved in the content and hopefully hear some of the best career advice people have ever heard. And then on Friday, what we're launching is also new. So a new part of the Lions Live platform. It's a resources and guides section. So you'll be able to download a toolkit. You'll be able to try your hand at some creative exercises. But most importantly, we are going to launch our 2021 editorial themes as informed by our global state of creativity survey, which thousands of people all over the world have taken part in. So exciting stuff. What should our viewers look out for over the next four days? Well, we're, we're going to bring back some of the well-loved formats like CMO in the Spotlight, but we're also introducing new segments as well, including something called the Dear Creators of 2021 series. And that's going to feature creative heavyweights, hopefully kicking off each day with a call to arms for our entire industry. So you'll hear from experts outside of the industry as well, including best-selling authors like Greg Orm, uh, Todd Henry, and also Alison Chadwick. And they're going to be bringing unique specialism uh, insights 
and a slight departure from our more traditional content and focusing more on coaching and the coaching of our creative community at a time where we could probably use it. So lots to look forward to there. And Simon, I know you don't like to pick favourites. Um, any particular highlights, though, that you are looking forward to personally? Uh, personally, that's a good question. I. I am actually really looking forward to the Dear Creators of 2021. I've no idea what's coming. I haven't heard anything about it, but I've heard that they're very topical. And as I said, a real call to arms for our industry at a very interesting time. So looking forward to seeing what's on their agenda and what we should all be thinking about for the year ahead. Simon, thank you very much for whetting our appetite. Uh, after that, I'm very much looking forward to the week we have ahead. Let's take a quick look at what we have coming up today. In my book, I reveal four human superpowers. In this fast changing context, we all need to get comfortable with how to unlearn to relearn. What you can do is try the five hour rule. This is less of being new normal and of more being the new. This is the next chapter. What's the role of trust? and transparency in your brand and how you tell that story. You don't wait to be motivated. Don't wish you were motivated. You can bring motivation to your work. That's just an important part of our job is to bring the humanity and the empathy um, to things, to anything a company does. What we do by bravely creating our work is we keep the entire ecosystem moving. Before we get started, we have a flavour of what's to come from one of our speakers. In this quickfire round of 21 questions for 2021, Tanya Koenig helps you to get to know one of the experts you'll see later on today. Let's see who's first up in the hot seat. Hello and welcome to Lions 21 for 21, where we ask our guests 21 quick fire questions to understand who they really are. I'm Tani Koenig and today I'm joined by Greg Orm. He's a speaker and author of The Human Edge, which won Business Book of the Year 2020. Hi, Greg. Um, so let's get started. Who are you? I'm a business author, as you said. I'm a leadership facilitator and I work with clients at London Business School and elsewhere. And how have you found remote working? Up and down, like like everybody. But, you know, what's got me through is I try and focus on what is left rather than what's forbidden. And what's the sharpest skill you bring to the table? Uh, a sense of humour. What's a talent that you don't have that uh, you're incredibly jealous of? I have a really terrible poker face. I react too big, too quickly. And what's a talent that you do have that other people are jealous of? I have been told the way I write and the way I speak helps to get complicated issues across in a way people can understand. So Greg, did you learn a new skill over the course of the last year? Uh, my downward dog has definitely improved. And are you trying to learn a new skill this year? I'm going to have to learn how to walk into a room and probably not hug and pick people and shake their hands because I think that'll still be off the table for some time to come. And what are fundamental skills or qualities you look for when hiring? I really need to work with people who want, however good they are, I want them to learn and want to learn every day with me, alongside me. What is a skill that you think is becoming unnecessary in the industry for this year? Oh, you know, I, I don't know, because I, I really try and focus on what's what's positive. And, and, you know, I've spent three or four years writing The Human Edge, which is all about the important skills. And so I've got four in there and I'll quickly list them. Consciousness, which is finding meaning in your work and focus in a digitally distracted world. Curiosity. And I already talked about learning course creativity and the ability to collaborate and experiment with fellow human beings. And what are the biggest challenges you're facing professionally uh, this year? My biggest challenge is staying focused and finding quiet time to think and to write while running my business and also dealing with clients. And what are the biggest challenges you think uh, the creative will face this year? 
Well, I, I think the creative industry really needs, like most industries, to understand how do you properly manage remote work? And there's a particular challenge in how do you create those what I call the lucky conversations, the lucky discussions that happen in the physical world. What makes a terrific leader in 2021? The leaders that I see succeeding will be able to connect to people, sometimes through the lens. They'll be able to uh, help people to have a laugh and bring all of themselves to work. And what makes an absolutely terrible leader in 2021? People who just see human beings as instruments for their own will. People who are inauthentic, po-faced, serious, untruthful. Is a virtual world good or bad for creativity? Oh, you can't ask that question and expect me to give a short answer, Tanya. It, it's just not you that simple. I mean, there are, plus, there are plus sides. Knowledge sharing is faster and more rapid. You can build teams together from across the world very rapidly. They may be outweighed by the, uh, the the bad points, which individual creativity is being shattered by the fact that we're being dis, uh, distracted on an industrial scale by our smartphones. What are your video call pet peeves? Senior leaders who just have not got it yet. You really need to be able to deliver on camera. What's the funniest thing that's happened to you at work this year? I, I give um, seminars to leaders from this office, which is in my home, all, all the time. And as I'm talking to 60 CEOs from across Europe, this guy just appears above the screen and starts wiping on the window. And I realize it's our window cleaner and he's making eye contact with me and he just won't go away. And this lasted for like five minutes. I love that. And what unexpected thing do you think will become huge in 2021? Everybody's going to come out of lockdown a few pounds heavier. So maybe they're going to need a bit of elastic in their trousers just to, to get to work for the first couple of months. And what's the worst piece of advice that you heard for 2021? It's hunker down and wait for this to pass and, and everything will come back to how it was. It's just not going to be like that. What trends or business practices do you secretly hope will go away in 2021? That old idea that business is so serious that you can't bring your real self, a sense of humor to work. I really hope that goes away now. And what's the best piece of advice uh, for the creative of those audience in 2021? If you're trying to influence someone in a creative business, stop providing all the answers and start asking better questions. Greg, that was it. Thank you so much, uh, Greg, for joining us today. And for everyone who is watching, make sure to check out Greg's virtual presentation, Get Hooked on Curiosity, the gateway drug to creativity as part of Lion's Life. <laughs> It's now time for some real inspiration, and that comes to you via our Dear Creators of 2021 series, a state of the state lecture from some of the best and brilliant minds in the industry, encouraging you to push the boundaries, think outside the box, and keep discovering your creative possibilities. This is a call to action and one to pay close attention to. Today's inspiration comes from the chief creative officer and founder of Badger and Winters, Madonna Badger. Dubbed as the lioness who roared, this 30-year advertising veteran is the founder of Hashtag Women Not Objects, a former president of the Glass Lion Jury and currently chairs Lion's See It, Be It initiative to advance future female creative directors. Following this presentation, we are going to have a live Q&A with Madonna. All of our live Q&As are powered by the brand building platform we transfer, who are supporting Lions Live all week. Now over to Madonna with her very important message to you all, the creative community. If there's one thing that last year has taught us all, it's that we live in a time of enormous uncertainty. One day we're all going to work, we're going to school, everything seems fine. People have jobs, people are, you know, just sort of complaining about the usual stuff. And in, within a 24 hour period, all of that was gone. And I think that more than anything, uncertainty and the things that we take for granted was, were suddenly ripped away. Everyone was really at a loss, including me. And, um, 
but where I found strength for myself, and I think the bulk of my company, uh, the people that work for me did too, is that I wanted to show up for them. I wanted to show up for them so that they kept their jobs, so that we kept our clients, so that we could keep moving forward. Um, and that the worst thing uh, my partner and I decided would be to let anyone go um, in the middle of a pandemic um, and you know, not knowing what's gonna happen next, um, even though we were quite worried ourselves. And you know, the whole world was showing up. Doctors were showing up, nurses were showing up, um, police were showing up, uh, people were showing up for people. Um, it was really an extraordinary time, and it's still an extraordinary time. Um, and all of that showing up really has to do with bravery. Being brave enough to walk through the uncertainty, being brave enough to see that, you know, things are not going to be as I think they're going to be, but I'm going to show up anyway. Um, and that's what I think most of us have done through this pandemic. I think the future of creativity is that we're going to finally come to terms with the truth that we are a part of a gigantic ecosystem and that we need those other industries as much as they need us. You know, advertising as an industry is slated to be over 230 billion um, in the, by the year 2023. And that to me says that not only are we important, not only do we employ an enormous amount of people, but we also keep things moving. What we do by bravely creating our work is we keep the entire ecosystem moving. And we also keep people's brains moving, thinking, looking at change, looking at purpose, looking at what can happen on a different global basis from a social standpoint. Um, you know, I, look, I think about work like Nike Dream Crazy or Always uh, Like a Girl or The Fearless Girl by McCann. I mean, this work is so brave, so smart, so mind changing. Um, and that, you know, what did they go through, I wonder, those creatives, in order to be brave enough to come up with ideas where there, were, there was no certainty of these ideas working, um, but they did it anyway. And, you know, obviously, the rewards were amazing. And that's what it means to be brave um, in our creativity, is that we're brave, we show up, we're creative, and we walk through the vulnerabilities. We walk through you know, the, the account managers who say no. We walk through uh, people telling us that's not the right brief, that's not the right way to go. And when we walk through those fears through that uncertainty, that's when we are brave. My agency was brave when, you know, we, we launched hashtag women not objects. And the number one reason why we wanted the objectification of women to stop is because of the harm that it was causing children, the harm that it was causing women, the harm that it was causing men and how they look at women. Um, and that our number one basis of how to judge that uh, was empathy. And when we finally got the main stage at Cannes, um, which is an unbelievable story in and of itself, um, that you know, dream really uh, came to be um, because Phil Thomas um, at Cannes, as well as his you know, amazing uh, team that works all around him, understood um, what was, you know, what we were asking and wanted to help. And so today, in every jury book, um, in every room, in every jury room at Cannes, um, there is now a rule that says work that objectifies a man or a woman cannot receive an award, and that the number one way to know 
if it is objectifying is through empathy. So what if that was my mother or my father or my sister or my friend? And so that for me is just the epitome of bravery um, by can uh, to see how important it is for all of us to stop. And that by taking away any ability to win a lion, um, you know, that that was really what made the behavior stop. And, um, and it has. And, you know, that's something not only am I very proud of, but um, it's made me want to do more things, um, which is a great feeling. What is a thigh gap? When you're standing straight up, there's like a gap in between your thighs. Girls just don't want their thighs to touch. No. The Kylie Jenner challenge has gone viral. Doctors warn it can cause a number of issues. Oh my God. Oh my God. We raise our little girls to view their bodies as projects to constantly be improved. Advertising often trivializes battering, sexual assault, and even murder. Cologne continues to speak of up to a thousand men groping women on New Year's Eve. I just think that it's harming women psychologically, physically, mentally, socially. You released a video anonymously on YouTube. Yes. I, I wish I could play the whole video here because it's incredibly powerful. I love giving blowjobs to sandwiches. I hope when my daughter grows up that she has friends just like these. The key to my heart? A man that smells like a vagina. I'd sell my body for a burger. So I think that um, you know, being brave in our creativity means showing up for that pitch, winning the pitch, feeling super vulnerable and speaking up in a meeting, um, you know, feeling like it's maybe not the greatest idea, but suddenly it brings out 10 others. You know, that's what bravery in creativity looks like. Being brave and walking through uncertainty is what has really given me so much strength. And I'm going to tell a story now that, um, you know, a lot of you probably know, but, um, you know, it's the single most defining moment for me of my life. Um, and uh, that was when my three little girls died um, on Christmas morning. Um, they were all under the age of nine and uh, my parents died as well, and I didn't die, um, and uh, I'm here. So, um, you know, here's what I have, one of the billions of things that I found out along this road is that, you know, I thought that everything was certain. I thought I had everything, you know, moving in a certain way, I knew how my life was going to unfold. I knew what was going to happen. Um, I had no real humility um, to understand that life can change in the blink of an eye. Um, and that, you know, what that has to do with the fire or not isn't really the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is about control. And that is that um, I wish I had understood not only, of course I knew the preciousness of my children and my parents and our relationship. Um, you know, of course that was firm for me. But what I really didn't understand was that an ad isn't precious or an idea isn't precious and that those things are really meant to um, be in the place of creativity and uncertainty um, and, and brave enough really to let go and have other people, uh, you know, kind of help walk me through to whatever the right creativity might be. Um, I, that's how I can apply this, what's happened to me with 
with Lily and Sarah and Grace and my parents um, leaving me. Um, uh, you know, it's obviously been horrible, um, but I've had to be brave enough um, to show up in the uncertainty. And my job helps me a lot with that because um, I love my job. Um, and I also uh, feel brave enough to believe that I'll see them one day again. And so um, that gives me a lot of comfort. The thing that um, I want to really leave you with is this idea that if you're brave and you walk forward toward the uncertainty, but you clench your fists and hold on tight and think that you're going to fix that unruly boss or get that client to like you or win that pitch, you know, all of, that, all of those feelings of control are false. And not only that, but uncertainty will win every single time. And, um, and there's a lot of peace in letting go and not worrying about the unruly boss. Just worry about, are you doing the best job you can? You know what I mean? I think that's really the thing that I've learned the most. So we have to be brave. We have to be brave. We have to have courage as we walk through heartache, as we walk through sadness and grief, as we walk through losing jobs, sometimes getting jobs, uh, getting married, getting unmarried. Uh, you know, there are so many parts of life that we have to be brave to walk through. So where am I in all of this? Um, you know, I show up every day, I'm brave, I walk through uncertainty every single day, I do it as fearlessly as I can. I try to change the world every day, with a post, with a conversation, watching a certain documentary, uh, understanding something differently, not only because my children are gone do I have that time, but I also think that that's part of what I owe this lifetime, is to try to use my skills of communication and marketing to do whatever I can to bring light to things that just live in darkness. So this is how to face uncertainty in the 21st century. I believe that we face it bravely, we feel it, we experience it as much as we can, and we show up, and we don't try to figure out what the outcome is going to be. And I think when you apply that kind of thinking to creativity, I think what happens is magical. Because that type of bravery to show up when you don't know the outcome to try something different when you don't know the outcome. I think that's the best kind of bravery in the world of creativity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madonna, inspiring us to show up bravely in these uncertain times. You are bravery personified. And judging by all of the questions coming in, our viewers think so too. So let's dive straight into the first question, which is how do you keep yourself motivated on a daily basis? Um, I actually, uh, I'm actually motivated by the people I work with. Um, you know, I have an incredible team of people um, Grace Chu and Celeste Holt Walters and Clark Fisher and then, you know, everyone else, uh, Kristen Murphy and Maddie and I mean, just so many wonderful people that are a part of my agency. And um, I want to, you know, wake up and show up for them. Um, and I also believe that, you know, I have a duty to the clients that we have to show up and do the best I can. And it, and it motivates me because I really like my work. I really like what I do. That sounds so selfless that you are 
you are showing up for other people, but how do you nourish yourself? Yeah, nourishing myself is tough. Um, Self-care is tough, I would say. Um, not the best at it. And, um, you know, the, I mean, the, you know, I have a spiritual life that certainly nourishes me. Um, but I also find that, you know, there's, uh, I once had an osteopath that said to me that there's a certain kind of monkdom um, in doing work that you love, um, you know, that that can be monk-like. And I think that's an interesting idea that, um, you know, we, we don't have to go to a monastery in order to find work that we love or that satisfies us or that nourishes us or soothes us, um, that that can be, you know, I'm lucky enough that my work is in creativity um, and that it really, you know, stimulates my the frontal lobe of my brain um thank god and so i can stay engaged what's your advice to young creatives how can we be more confident about our own ideas how can we be more brave in our creativity um you know i'm the uh chairperson for see it be it um which is the mentorship program at can for young women and um, the la last year that we did it live, um, we talked a lot about imposter syndrome. And um, their belief was that it was something only women suffered from. Um, and then we had a, a mentorship program um, at the girls' lounge um, with uh, Shelly Zalis. And there were men there to mentor them as well as women. And the men said, hey, I, I suffer from imposter syndrome. You know, we all do. Um, and so I think it's just Im important to remember that everyone, you know, feels nervous. I feel nervous. Um, I feel unsure. You know, I need um, to work with a team in order to know if I'm going in the right direction. You know, I'm not always right. I don't always know. Um, you know, I rarely know. So um, I think it's, it, it's important to, for everyone to realize that we're all in the same boat, um, that we all struggle um, with confidence. We all struggle with imposter syndrome. We all struggle to be brave. Um, and that when our, you know, colleagues or even our clients, someone speaks up um, and says something, you know, the best bet is to um, try to hear it from that place of, they probably are feeling a little vulnerable saying that, or they're probably feeling a little, you know, worried. So why don't I try to, to listen to them in a way that um, buoys them or, you know, helps them feel more confident? I think that's a part of being a team. Next question. The Women Not Objects campaign is so inspiring. How are you planning to grow this important initiative in the future? Um, it's interesting, you know, I, um, when we made uh, Women Not Objects that year at the Super Bowl, um, there was an ad that, um, where they sold women in a vending machine. And there was another ad um, for a hamburger company where the woman had hamburgers for her bra. Um, so, you know, since then, um, a lot has changed. And by having the rules um, at can change, the jury rules change, um, people can't win lions with objectifying work. Um, and so that has made it um, really difficult for objectifying work to get made on a, you know, sort of by the major leagues, by the big boys and girls that, you know, do all that kind of work, creative work. And... Um, and so, you know, it's it. In other words, it's kind of taking care of itself um, because of that change at can and because of that change at the at, in the jury rooms. Um, when there is uh, that sort of work, um, you know, I think it's important to call it out. And you know, with the Super Bowl, and I know the three percent movement does a lot of work like that too. Um, so I think it's just important to call it out when we see it. How did your clients react to the Women Not Objects campaign? 
Well, the clients that we had, um, they were a lot of beauty clients. Um, and it was actually inspired by a client um, that was asking us to do um, ultra whitening on a woman's skin, a beauty client. Um, and, you know, that's really where we just, you know, started to really understand and look around and how much objectifying work was out there, um, you know, from sort of um, using women as props um, to, you know, over retouching beyond human recognition. Um, so we, um, oh, I just lost the track of the question. Tell me the question again, sorry. Um, it, w it was just to say, what, what, what did your clients uh, think about oh, right, the Women right. Not Objects campaign? Sorry, I got lost in the That's okay. client. Um, basically, they a lot of them fired us. Um, so <laughs> okay. we lost a lot of work, um, including from that beauty company. And, um, you know, it was some dire straits there for a while. Um, you know, we had been um, historically a beauty and fashion company um, that now suddenly, uh, agency that now suddenly was sort of going against a premise that they long had held as being okay. Um, so we got had to get new clients, um, and that was a great push for us um, to, you know, go into all sorts of different industries. Yeah, and how long ago was that? Because that sounds like, you know, the progressive thing to have done at that time. I can't imagine a similar campaign um, being greenlit now, for example. Why do you say that? Uh, just in terms of the ultra, we talked about the ultra skin whitening. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like something that, that, that wouldn't necessarily happen now. Oh, no, it's still happening. Right. I think it's still happening um, to a huge degree in Asia um, in India, um, you know, I think that that kind, those kind of practices are still happening. Um, but one of my um, mentees was from Pakistan, and she was making a, a movie. And there's a part in all sort of Bollywood movies, she said, that those sort of Pakistani Indian type of movies. Um, I'm sort of, you know, completely putting together a culture I don't really understand. Um, but this is what she said to me, is that there's always a part where a woman, kind of, the, the lead woman, does this very sort of, you know, enticing, uh, sexualized, objectifying sort of dance um, for her man. And she held up women, not objects, and said, we, we really shouldn't do this. This is not modern. This is not the way to do things anymore. So I think that it's really by... Um, you know, by going to Cannes, by having that opportunity um, to speak on the main stage about um, the, the harms of objectification um, and that it's all around us. Yeah. I think that um, internationally, it's been something that people are, are really calling out all over the world. Maybe it was wishful thinking on my part. Um, not a question, a statement, Madonna, you're a true inspiration. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned it's very important to realise we are a part of a, a gigantic ecosystem. How can we foster collaboration within our industry? Well, I think the ecosystem that I was talking about is not necessarily within our industry, although that would be great. Um, the ecosystem I'm talking about is, you know, that we are a part of, you know, the what we do can, um, you know, go to the factory floor and make more, you know, widgets or whatever it is. Um, we can, you know, in, we can be a, we're a part of an ecosystem where trucks are filled with product, where mostly CPG, but it works for cars, it works for iPhones, it works for just about anything. And that we are a part of that ecosystem um, of people being employed, of people, um, of companies being able to, you know, hire more people, um, have a more successful company, and that that those companies, you know, come down from the the bigger companies, and so we're a part of all of that, and of course we're a part of an ecosystem within our own industry um, where yes, there's an enormous amount of competition. I think that that's healthy. 
Um, that's the way that we can, you know, um, personally, I, that's the a huge motivator for me is my own competitive spirit. Um, but I think, um, I think it's important to understand that, that we're not, you know, there's so much shame built around advertising in a way and that it's sort of a lower form of creativity when I think it's really a great form of creativity and, you know, sort of adhere to the David Ogilvy viewpoint of advertising. Sumit would like to know, how can you make creativity, creative bravery, I should say, profitable and sustainable? How, how can I make creative... Bravery profitable and sustainable. I mean, I'm living proof of that. You know, my agency is living proof of that. We, um, not only did we do uh, No Kids in Cages for um, Raices, which is an organization that helps um, families, immigrant families, um, come into the United States, we did No Kids in Cages in response to the children that had been separated. Um, and so that was something that we did sort of from our hearts um, for Raices. But then we've done uh, an enormous amount of work for uh, companies like Citibank, like um, Procter & Gamble, um, you know, that where we do work that, for example, we see equal um, and or racial injustice for Olay. So it's, it isn't easy to be profitable, but if you make it, you know, your goal is to have purpose. I think that, you know, when over 65% of at least Americans believe that companies have more power than government to make change. Um, I think there's a lot of room um, for all of us to make change. We are out of time for any more questions, but I will finish on some comments. You are amazing, powerful message. Thank you so much, Madonna. What an inspiring film. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers for sending in those questions. We are going to have to leave it there. And now a call to action from the Lions team to remind you that moments that change the future make history. Is this your moment? Where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a
This week is all about sharpening your creative toolkit. But what are the skills required to future-proof your career? The new Expert Guide series, sponsored by Unity, brings you big thinkers from outside the industry to shed some light on how to master the creative skills of tomorrow. First up, we got to know him a bit earlier in the show, it's Greg Orm. Greg is the author of the 2020 Business Book of the Year, The Human Edge. He's going to reveal the secret source to unlocking new creative ideas and how to become addicted to day-to-day -day discovery. Greg will be joining me for a Q&A straight after, so please do send in your questions as you watch along. Get your notebooks at the ready. This is Greg Orm's expert guide to getting hooked on curiosity, what he calls the gateway drug to creativity. Hello, Lions. Greg Orm here. And I'm excited to share a solution with you about a challenge I think we all face in our professional lives. Research shows that in our school days and our work environments, they both tend to blunt our creative potential. Uh, we all face trade-offs. Should I, on this project, deliver something that's truly creative and innovative or just play it safe and deliver something that's a bit boring? Should I challenge the status quo or go along with what the group is saying and thinking? You know, I see it all the time in my leadership development work at London Business School and elsewhere. I work with truly eminent and senior people, but some of them have just lost their mojo somewhere along the way, fitting in, just getting along became a habit. And of course, it happens in the agency world too and other creative businesses I've worked with. And this is why I'm so excited to share some insights on what you can do about it, maybe some alternative habits. So do allow me to share the big picture before we dive into the detail. In my book, The Human Edge, I reveal four human superpowers to help you to thrive in the disrupted 2020s. Creativity is, of course, one of these four Cs. Another is consciousness. This is about finding meaning in your work and also making the precious time to be creative. Collaboration is, of course, vital to turn your ideas into reality. In this video, we're going to focus on curiosity. It's a perfect place to start because it unlocks the other three superpowers. I'm going to reveal practical science-based tips and techniques to help you to have better ideas and take your career to the next level. Along the way, I'll explain what curiosity does to us, what it can do for us, and how we can have more of it. Academics have struggled and found it tricky to pin curiosity down. It's that weird compulsion we human beings have just to know more. It's having to watch that Netflix episode after the cliffhanger ending. We've all been there during the lockdown. I know I have. It's a weird thing to study because it involves both thinking and feeling, which is why sometimes it's called the knowledge emotion. Anything that's emotional is always deeply personal. So let me tell you about a traumatic moment in my childhood that has made curiosity really personal to me. When I was seven years old, my parents were really worried about me. I wasn't doing very well at school. Like a lot of boys of that age, I was more interested in going out and having fun than reading books. As a result, my reading age was two years younger than it should have been. This parental anxiety was put into context, as life tends to do, when I contracted a potentially deadly disease. One afternoon, I was walking home from school with a pounding headache and sick to my stomach. Much later, my mum told me that the alarm bell started to ring for her when I refused the chicken pie she'd bought for my supper. This was the first time and probably the last I've ever turned down a pastry-based food product. It turned out I developed meningitis. Now, meningitis causes fluid to collect on your brain, too much fluid, and you slip into a coma, which, you know, apparently is not good. The doctors told my parents to constantly read to me day and night to keep me from falling asleep. 
there was a chance I might never wake up. Now I've become a writer. Looking back, it's weird that reading kept me alive. I think that's why I'm so passionate about it. And maybe not surprising that much of my professional life has been spent figuring out how to make myself and other people more engaged and more curious about the world. I mean, we've never needed curiosity more than in 2021. Uh, we desperately need a creative and curious response to a world that's changing at accelerating speeds. But it's not just that. Curiosity also preserves and protects your unique humanity in a digital world. More than half of the globe is now on social media and we're scrolling for a greater part of our day than ever before. The pandemic at work has also accelerated the uptake of technology. Suddenly, doctors were seeing their patients online, teachers were giving virtual classrooms, and I think and forecast that Zoom working will be here to stay at least part time for all of us. Also, at the same time, for the first time in history, artificial intelligence is coming for white collar jobs. 250 years ago in the first industrial revolution, machines replaced our arms and legs in the production process. In the fourth industrial revolution, machines are busily replacing our brains. Even before this pandemic, AI was encroaching on pretty complex jobs. For example, uh, AI is better at diagnosing cancer than any doctor on the planet. If somebody can write an algorithm, and it could be AI, that predicts 100% of the judgment calls and processes in your job, it will be automated. And we're already seeing uh, jobs like junior tax clerks, um, personal assistants, and supermarket cashiers being replaced by machines. For the rest of us, for knowledge workers, it will be a little bit different. We'll see the, the more simple and routine tasks in our jobs cheese sliced away by AI. And listen, where AI is better, there's very little point in competing. Far better to differentiate yourself from machines. And of course, there's an irony here. As machines become a bigger part of our life, it's far better to be more, not less human. There is some good news. Where AI is weak, we are strong and vice versa. So it's a great time to start reassessing and valuing your unique human gifts. I'm talking about things like your ability to find meaning in your work, critical thinking, common sense, a sense of humor, empathy, passion, and yes, curiosity. As the great artist Pablo Picasso once said, computers are useless. They only give you answers. Thanks to neuroscience, we know curiosity is hardwired into an ancient part of our brain. When you explore with curiosity, your brain secretes a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine is sometimes called the motivation molecule because it's associated with higher levels of drive and concentration and creativity. When you're low on dopamine, it's difficult to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, other symptoms include being depressed or having a low sex drive. When you've got lots of dopamine in your system, it's really pleasurable. And what's really interesting is over time, the relationship between the dopamine hits and your curiosity become a virtuous circle. It becomes a kind of benign addiction. In essence, you became your own drug dealer. Unlike other drug dealers, your brain will encourage you to get off your sofa every now and then. And it doesn't have a disposable phone or a facial tattoo. Here's the deeply cool thing about curiosity. It's not a fixed trait like having blue eyes. It's more like mercury in a thermometer. It rises and falls depending on what you do day to day. The rest of this video contains five proven habits to help make your temperature rise. Facebook 
and other social media apps serve you information based on your past behavior and the behavior of millions of other people that are similar to you. It means the information that's come your way has been edited. In effect, your past clicks built an echo chamber that's just for you. And this is highly pleasurable. I mean, how often in life do you get what you want every time? The problem is we're not well adapted to cope with this. We're the product of millions of years of evolution in hunter-gatherer tribes. And back then we learned to be highly suspicious of new ideas, attracted to dramatic news, and we didn't like strangers that might endanger us. These hardwired prehistoric cognitive biases are simply mental shortcuts to make faster decisions. They kept your ancestors alive. Your forebears were simply the fastest to react when the shadow of the saber-toothed tiger fell across the entrance to the cave. It's why we're here. While cognitive biases were once useful to us, now they can call us a real problem. For one, they urge us to reach for our smartphones like toddlers grabbing at sugary sweets. Confirmation bias, for example, urges us to go out in the world and try and find information that simply confirms our views and preconceptions instead of finding out anything new. And the AI-enabled algorithms that power social media know this and use it to their advantage. Confirmation bias is, is a personal problem for all of us, but it's also damaging our democracy. Take the angry, misinformed mob that stormed the US Capitol in Washington back in January. They were utterly convinced that election had been stolen despite the readily available evidence to the contrary. That wasn't just an assault on democracy. It was an assault on reality itself. The computer scientist Alan Kay once said, a change of perspective is worth 80 IQ points. Well, I think it's high time we all came together and reclaimed the truth. Here's a few simple ways to do that for yourself. First, always check your sources. When you find something interesting online, always ask yourself, is this from a dependable person or organization? And is there a way I could cross check it with another source? The second is to turn on your radar. So after you finish this video, just write down all the books and magazines and podcasts and YouTube channels and blogs that you're engaging with uh, every day. What are the conferences and training courses and groups that you're part of each year? How can you push yourself into new domains of knowledge? As the uh, satirist Jonathan Swift once wrote, Falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. Well, I think now lies are on digital steroids. So as a creative leader, it's never been more important to engage with what's actually going on, to form a fact-based view of the world. Well, I hope those simple things can help you to knock a few holes in that echo chamber that we all tend to build around ourselves. On to habit three. The World Economic Forum recently forecast that every four years or so, around 40% of our knowledge base needs to be discarded and replaced with something new. In this fast changing context, we all need to get comfortable with how to unlearn to relearn. Now that takes time, which is always a scarce resource. And it doesn't help that we're being distracted on an unprecedented and industrial scale. The smartphone is the most successful consumer product in history. So why do so many of us feel we're being enslaved? It's because left unmanaged, smartphones destroy our ability to learn, to think, to create, because they constantly interrupt us. Of course, some of the apps are labor saving and you can access the world's knowledge through these incredible devices. But the issue is proximity. 
the proximity to specialized and personalized social media feeds and always on work emails can lead to addiction and continual distraction if you're not careful. In the acclaimed 2020 Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, the ex-Google strategist James Williams calls this effect the largest, most standardized, most centralized form of attentional control in human history. Let's just take my hero, Albert Einstein, as an example of how this might impact. He famously did his creative thinking during the slack times in his job as a patent clerk. Do you think we would have had his theories if he'd also had an Instagram account? It's pretty ironic that to successfully differentiate from artificial intelligence, we occasionally need to disengage from the devices it powers. As the ability to focus becomes less common, those who can do it will become more valuable. It can really help to be inspired by the learning habits of the world's most successful people. Uh, when Bill Gates was the executive chairman of Microsoft back in the 90s, he found a way to prioritize learning in his life. Every year, he would take two think weeks away from the office in a secluded cottage, and he would just read and reflect. And it was during these periods of solitude that he stumbled upon the ideas which powered Microsoft's success for decades. The list of learning junkies goes on and includes Walt Disney, Frank Lloyd Wright, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Oprah Winfrey, Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos. It goes on. Now, for someone like Bill Gates, of course, a think week, an entire week, is a little bit easier to arrange. For the rest of us, that might be a challenge. But what you can do is try the five hour rule. This means however busy you are, find one hour five times every week to work on your development, your learning, your curiosity. It, it really adds up over six months, over a year. In fact, it's life changing. Have you ever noticed when you learn something new? It could be a new brand of car or a novel breed of dog or uh, something about a new pair of shoes. Those things seem to turn up everywhere. The streets are full of them. This effect can be explained by an interesting piece of psychological research. Your curiosity follows an inverted U-shape. This means if you find out something new in a new domain of knowledge, it piques your interest to find out more. Your new obsession turns up everywhere. New knowledge in a new domain primes your brain to be more interested in that subject. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It just goes on and on and drags you in. Becoming a knowledge explorer pays serious dividends for your creative potential. Creativity, innovation generally happens when one idea from a particular domain of knowledge jumps the fence and lands in a different field. Here's an example. Did you ever wonder why we have so many fonts in our word processor programs? It was because the late Steve Jobs snuck in the back of a calligraphy course after he dropped out of college. And that early experience of studying the art of handwriting made him a serious font nerd for the rest of his life. Learning new stuff builds little outposts in your mind. It's later when your brain builds a road between these outposts that you have a new idea. I'm sometimes asked, what's the best single piece of advice you'd give to someone hoping to be a better creative leader? This is it. Stop trying to provide all the answers. Instead, ask better questions. So curious questions are not closed questions. Those the type asked by prosecution lawyers, which lead to a yes or no answer. Closed questions are pretty good at establishing the facts but they don't take you anywhere new. Great questions are open questions. Questions like, why do we do it this way? What if we tried that way instead? Why not? Open questions lead to creative conversations. 
So may I suggest a new key performance indicator in your professional life? Questions per day. It's a fantastic way to measure how you express your own curiosity and the creative conversations that you spark around you. After I left hospital and recovered from meningitis, I was given a reading award by my primary school. Came with a prize, a copy of The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Now, I love reading, but I think you'd need to be 200 years old to like that book. I've checked, it's a reading age of 13 or upwards. I was seven, utterly baffled. I've kept my guilty secret all these years from my parents and my teachers. I never read it. Curiosity doesn't always click, it's personal. But if you try these five powerful but simple habits, you can grow your potential, demolish your echo chamber, check your sources, find time to unlearn, to relearn, become a knowledge explorer, ask better questions. Together they mix into a curiosity cocktail. It's a gateway drug to experimentation, invention, imagination. Take the blue pill for a lifetime of addiction to curiosity and creativity. Thank you, Greg. That was full to the brim with practical tips. I was making detailed notes watching. Viewers seem to have really enjoyed it too. We've had a number of questions come in for you. Let's go to our first one, Greg, which is, uh, can you share any practical tips on how to succeed in digital detox? Oh, right. So actually following through on that, I... <laughs> Yes, I think practical tips, uh, some of which may have been in the video, but what I do, uh, it, and everybody suffers from this, myself included, I'm still on LinkedIn, I'm still on Twitter, I still use Facebook a bit, is to actually not just, um, not just try to withstand that temptation, but to completely remove it from the room. So, uh, I, you know, at the end of the day, I actually take my phone away from myself, I get it to charge in a different room. Uh, I actually um, also try and find meaning in the other things I'm doing. Uh, meaning really drives your ability to be engaged and motivated and get into a, a sense of flow. So on the one hand, don't try and withstand the interruptions, just get rid of them. And on the other, really try and find meaning and engagement in the things that you're doing. Try and really dig deep and think, why am I doing this as well as what and how am I doing it? Okay, thank you very much. Next, I want to talk to you about curiosity. Now, curiosity is essential for, for my job, journalism, broadcasting. I've always thought it was innate. Can you teach curiosity? And the question that's come in is, how do you keep yourself curious? Yes, and I, well, I think, uh, of course, everything's innate. We're born with a certain amount of uh, inheritance from our DNA physically and cognitively. But the exciting thing about curiosity is it's not, as I said in the video, it's not a fixed trait. You can grow it. And that, uh, that is great. I find that very inspiring. So uh, a lot of the tips in the video are about growing it and using it all the time. You know, think of it like a muscle. If you use it, it will get stronger. If you don't use it, it gets weaker and flabbier and it just goes away. So it's about use, uh, personally speaking. It's about who you surround yourself with. Uh, we're all used to viruses and you catch it from the people you're with. And of course, it's about what you're introducing into your brain, that fuel I was talking about. So keep that interesting, keep that varied, and you can therefore grow it. And uh, what one day leads to the next, I think a curious person becomes a more curious person. Merko wants to know, uh, think of an organisation where uh, curiosity is core to its culture. What are its top three traits? Yeah, I, th I think I would uh, probably pick one of my favourites, which is Pixar. Um, I'm not sure if I can come up with three off the top of my head, but uh, I've studied Pixar and read about it and, uh, and uh, really thought about it and interviewed people from there. And I think one of the things that they do is that they learn and just as I was saying in the video, they learn across boundaries. So 
um, the Pixar University, as they call it, their uh, their learning foundation teaches accountants drawing, for example. Now, why would an accountant need to learn how to draw? And when you ask them, why do you do that? They say, well, actually, a core skill to drawing is the ability to ob observe acutely. So it's about these transferable skills and hopping out of the particular silo that you're in that they do so well. The other thing that I would say is uh, they have a thing called the Brains Trust at Pixar. Uh, and that when, when, a, when a, a movie is born, it's like got its first kind of idea, it goes through the Brains Trust and then subsequently through the production process. And so they, the culture in that Brains Trust is one of intense, unflinching questioning, but also in a supportive, non-political way. Uh, and so I think that idea of really allowing others in your life to inspect your work, as long as you trust them and that they have the credibility, that is a really good thing to do. And, and I love what they call it. Uh, Ed Catmull, the founder of Pixar, calls their movies early on ugly babies. And what he <laughs> means by that is no, no idea is born beautiful. It takes quite a lot of effort and questioning and changing and that's how they come out really well. They don't they don't just get born beautiful. They 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 grow because they've been challenged. Greg, so many questions have come in for you, but we're out of time. A very quick answer to this one, though, if you would. Bruno wants to know, how do you balance curiosity, the input of information and production output creativity? Well, I, I, sorry, Bruno, I don't think there's a pat answer to that. Like a lot of things with curiosity and creativity, I think of it as the yin and yang you have to constantly toggle between the two. That's your judgment. Of course, we all need to deliver to deadline, especially in the advertising industry. But you have to manage and try and take control of your precious time to work out when you're taking in the cognitive fuel to get the ideas and when you're delivering and when you're sort of going down the process. Part of that is just a meta awareness of where you are personally in that particular process and on that particular project. Greg, it's been an absolute pleasure. That flew. Thank you so much. We're going to have to leave it there. This week is all about sharpening your creative toolkit. At the end of the week, you can put your new skills to the test in the Young Lions Live Award Competition. Open to all young creatives aged 18 to 30, the Young Lions Live Award challenges you to answer a brief set by an international NGO, test your creativity against your peers, and get your work seen by the wider industry. Here's What's in store? We have another preview of one of our speakers coming up later today. In this quick fire round of 21 questions for 2021, Tanya Koenig helps you to get to know another of today's speakers and puts them through their paces. Let's see who's up in the hot seat now. Hello and welcome to Lines 21 for 21, where we ask our guests 21 questions to find out who they really are. I'm Tanya Koenig and I'm joined by Todd Henry. He's an author and self-titled arms dealer of the creative revolution. So Todd, welcome and let's get started. Who are you? Well, you just mentioned I'm an arms dealer for the creative revolution. I guess to expand on that, I'm the author of five books that have been translated into more than a dozen languages. How have you found remote working? I, I don't like re remote working at all. I like being around people. What's the sharpest skill you bring to the table? Uh, I think the sharpest skill I bring to the table is my ability to ask uncomfortable questions. What's a talent that you don't have or that you're incredibly jealous of? Oh, that's easy. Uh, drawing. I wish I was a better visual artist. And what's a talent that you have and other people are jealous of? 
I think my comfort in front of a crowd, I could speak in front of a crowd of 10,000 people and be perfectly comfortable. And I often hear that people are、uh, very jealous of that. Are you trying to learn a new skill this year? I am trying to learn how to become a better audio engineer, how to record music so that it sounds better right here in my home studio. I can tell by your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> And did you learn a new skill over the course of the last year? I did. I actually had to figure out how to create a video production studio,、uh, you know, and how to deliver high quality online video to my clients who I speak to because I can't be there with them in person. Okay, so it had an impact on your work, I guess. Yeah,、uh, because you know, I'm used to traveling all over the world and speaking to large groups of people, and those large groups aren't gathering right now. And what are fundamental skills that you look for when hiring? The three things primarily are curiosity. I want people who can ask good questions,、uh, grit, people who are willing to stick with things when they get uncomfortable, and resourcefulness. I want people who don't come to me asking a million questions, I want them to be able to go figure it out for themselves. And what is a skill that you think will be unnecessary in the industry today or in the future? I think that we're moving into a more highly collaborative economy where we all need to be able to listen to and respond to others and collaborate with others and lead by influence, not by control. What are the biggest challenges you're facing professionally、uh, in the coming year? Learning how to deal with this hybrid. Uh, in person and remote work situation because I don't think we're going to go back 100% to in person work. What are the biggest challenges you think creative will face in the coming year? How to、uh, communicate their work when they aren't necessarily sitting face to face with the client or sitting face to face with、uh, their, their collaborators. And what makes a terrific leader in 2021? Uh, I think empathy and resolve are the two qualities. And what makes an absolutely terrible leader in 2021?、Uh, I'll go back to one of my previous answers, which is control. I think that terrible leaders are leaders who try to control their team versus leading them by influence and principle. Is a virtual world good or bad for creativity?、Um, I think it's neither. I think, you know, just like anything else, I think it's all about how we respond to the virtual world. So I think it introduces some unique challenges, but also some amazing opportunities. What are your video call pet peeves? If I want to look at the screen and see someone, that means I'm not looking in the camera.、Um, so that's one of my pet peeves is that I can't make eye contact, I can't, you know, see people's responses. What's the funniest thing that's happened to you at work this year? I have three children at home, and my wife works at home as well. And so I hear all kinds of conversations happening outside my office while I'm presenting to you know, 500 people. So that's probably the funniest thing, or some of the things I can't share, but that I overheard outside my office. What unexpected thing do you think will become huge in 2021? I think what we're going to see is just a real aura of global celebration when we come out of this in a way that we haven't seen in a while. And I think it's going to be a unifying thing. I really do. What's the worst piece of advice you've heard for 2021?、Uh, we're going to go back to normal. And what trends or business practices do you secretly hope will go away in 2021? So I, I hope that we don't see correspondence as throwaway or trivial, but that instead we start to interact with one another in a more meaningful way. And what's、uh, your best piece of advice for the creative dose audience in 2021?、Um, your creative process、um, is your responsibility. If you want to be brilliant when it matters most, you have to build practices into your life to prepare you for those moments when you need to be brilliant. That's all of the questions. Thank you very much,、uh, Todd, for joining. And for everyone who is watching, be sure to check out、uh, Todd's virtual presentation called Discover Your Creative Drivers as Part of Lion's Life. I hope that gave you a flavor of what you can expect from Todd in his expert guide session later today. But next up is the first CMO in the Spotlight session, sponsored by The Economist Group. This is your opportunity to hear firsthand what's front of mind for these leading marketers. Nadja Bellen White, the Global Chief Marketing Officer of Vice Media Group, is next up in the spotlight. And digging into the questions that matter is the executive and diplomatic editor of The Economist, Daniel Franklin. Once again, I'm going to be joined by Nadja after the session to take all of your questions, so do please send them in as you watch along. Over to Nadja and Daniel.
Hello, I'm Daniel Franklin, Executive Editor at The Economist, and the weekly newspaper sits within The Economist Group, which works with a wide range of commercial clients to help them respond to the transformation around them. That's why all this week we're putting CMOs in the spotlight at Lions Live. And in the spotlight with me today is Nadia Bellin White, the Global Chief Marketing Officer at Vice Media Group. Nadia, welcome. Good morning to you. How are you this morning? Good. Good morning. Very well. And first of all, before going any further, I gather that this is the first time that Vice has had uh, someone in this particular position with this job title. What, why, why now? Why has this happened? You know, it's an interesting question. You know, they've had um, CMOs in the past um, that have been largely focused on, on one particular division. But this is the first time that the team has decided they needed a global chief marketing officer that would combine um, the might of marketing and, and comms and insights, which is really at the center of what we do, to really oversee our global portfolio um, across studios, news, um, TV, uh, dot com, our agency business and, and, and growing films business and production all under one roof. And um, it's really exciting time to be here at Vice Media Group. So is that, in a sense, uh, a, a sign of uh, a maturing vice? I know that the, the, the culture is forever going to be a, a sort of fresh and youthful one, but is, it, is vice, in a sense, growing up? You know, it's interesting. Um, I've had this conversation with, with several people. When you look underneath the hood of Vice Media Group, and some people remember Vice, they remember waiting for the magazine to come. They remember um, always being at the center of culture and always being of the moment. Um, what they forget is this is the Vice Media Group that has an award-winning um, news division with 10 years of experience in news. Uh, this is the Vice Media Group that has assembled um, trust with consumers at a time when trust is really under attack. This is the Vice Media Group that's helped Beyonce produce Lemonade, Gangs of London. I mean, so much award-winning work. And A-list um, directors, filmmakers, storytellers, as well as emerging artists come here because of that. When you look at our competitive group, um, they think of us as purely in the digital space, and that is a, an important part of our portfolio. But you realize how diverse we are and how global we are. And when you look so, at... So you, you, you've been there just four months. Was this, a, in a sense, a bit of a surprise to you, l l learning how, how Vice is, what Vice is today? It's tremendous. Um, you know, I was talking to uh, Simone Oliver at Refinery29, and, and, and the way we have our finger on the pulse of what young women are thinking. If you talk to our teams, um, you know, at ID, in terms of having our finger on the pulse of, of, of fashion and culture and what's next, that's who we are. We have uh, become this engine. Um, we have at our, our fingertips um, an engine of, of data, of information, of of consumer trends and behaviors. And if you think about the point we're in in time, as some call the great reset, this moment in the world where um, there's a responsibility for media companies and, 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 and partners such as ourselves to really help charter a path forward. Um, we can always say that things are not gonna be perfect, but I've always maintained that working in this industry is a burden and a privilege. Now, what are you gonna do with that privilege? What truth are you going to tell? How do you help people navigate what's next? And Vice Media Group is uniquely poised to really help lead that effort. Just want to give a, a little bit more um, sense of, of the global nature. The global is in your, is in your title. I, I guess, again, most people would think of Vice as predominantly US. That's probably still the case. But, but you're much more than that now. So where are you in the world? And, and what are the growing markets for you? I would say, where are we not? I would say almost 50% of our revenue is outside the United States. Um, you know, we're quickly, quickly growing. Um, we're already in APAC. We're in Saudi Arabia. We're across every um, country in Europe. We're in Latin America. We have a great division out of Mexico City. It's kind of the gateway to, to Latin America. 
um, as well as in the U.S. So we're in probably over 25 countries and growing. Every time I, each day I learn about a different place that, that, that Vice uh, Media Group is recording from. And more importantly, we have partners in almost every part of the world. You know, what's interesting about um, being at Vice Media Group is the, we have a, a listening, the ability to really listen to what, what people are saying, to what voices are saying, um, both young and old, um, but we give give a platform to those who perhaps have not always had a voice. Um, and sometimes what we end up portraying to people is a truth that they want to see and a truth that they don't want to see. Okay, so I think that gives us a, 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 a good idea of what vice is today or what it's, how, it's, how it's developing. Uh, I, I want to get a sense of what your really big... Uh, challenges, um, excitements are, and, and the cutting edge of this for you. You talked about the Great Reset. What do you really mean by that? I believe that we're at an inflection point in the world. I don't have to tell you that. If you look at some of the, um, the obvious challenges to democracy and um, the anxiety that, that many feel as though they've not been heard, um, and not just, you know, I think if you're sitting here in the U.S., you, one would argue this is happening in the U.S. I've lived in London. You know the impact of, of Brexit. You talk to colleagues around the world about the changing dynamics of the rise of the East that's been happening for some time. And these divergent voices are crying out for, for change. And there are those, so, so one would argue that we're in the belly of the beast. We're in the belly of the revolution. But as all great revolutions, there comes a bit of a renaissance and a reawakening and a reimagining. But this only happens if you have to bring people along on this journey. What's, what's great about Vice, um, what's great about our value proposition is we have a legacy built on trust. And when you have the trust of the consumer, of that voice that has been developed over time based on our history and reputation in news and culture. You then begin to see how that would help some brands um, regain trust with consumers, help them figure out how to navigate what's next, particularly at a time when many big businesses um, have, have lost a bit of their way. When you think about the fact that, I think I read a report that 19% of consumers distrust big businesses, and I don't know if that's accurate, it's probably a sentiment of how frustrated people are. So you then see their potential role of a vice media group in helping to help navigate the next of what's happening currently, how to interpret that through the eyes of culture, but also um, by really listening to people saying, we don't have all the answers, but we can help you figure out the future, potentially. So how is the, um, your, your focus directed? Is it mainly focused on uh, marketing to these clients, these brands that might wish to associate themselves with Vice, or is it marketing to the consumer? Are you primarily focusing B2P or B2C? I have a team that focuses on both. I have a team that continues to invest and build upon our reputation that we've had with consumers for, for years. And we continue to work with our teams, Munchies and ID, and we have a firm team that's focused on that. I also have a team that's quite focused on B2B. I mean, given my background and experience having worked in agencies, I have relationships with uh, CMOs and CEOs around the world. So being able to bring a bit of that knowledge through my unique perspective of how Vice can help is, is pretty extraordinary. And, and based on the preliminary conversations I've had with some partners, like you, Daniel, they're like, I had no idea that Vice Media Group had all of this at its disposal. More importantly, I had no idea that you have your finger on the pulse of data on culture, particularly at a time when people are trying to navigate through it now. We are in, un we are in unprecedented times. So being able to have a partner that can listen and help you figure out how to see around those corners. I'm not saying that we're this great oracle, but I'm saying we can help you figure it out. And isn't that refreshing to have a partner that can help you do that? And that partner is us. Okay, so I'd be very fascinated to explore two things in all this. One is, perhaps this is where we should go first, is 
Vice can see around the corner, you've got your ear to the ground, what's next? I want, I want to know what is next? What are you seeing around the corner? What, and, and, and how is that going to uh, affect or influence the world of marketing? Data has always been important in marketing. Let me just first tell you, I've been a, a data-centric marketer for years to come. How that data is used to help drive culture and growth and brands is going to be critical. And so much of what we see is not just, it's seen beyond the numbers that you see on the, on the page. It's seeing behaviors and patterns and how those form trends that, that, that um, partners are looking for. One particular um, partner who shall be nameless is saying, I, we say we understand the culture, but quite frankly, Naja, when I look outside my window, I don't understand anything that's happening right now. And all of the reams of data can't help me. So it's a, it's a unique balance of the qualitative and quantitative that we use to, to help you figure out what's currently happening and how that impacts your brands in the future. What are you seeing? What are, what are we... What do we expect uh, to be around the corner in terms of cultural trends and, and things that we should, uh, all of us in, in, in the world, be uh, have our eye on as, as uh, trends that are going to influence us? Well, one trend that has not gone away is the importance of trust and transparency. I think that many brands have taken that for granted and almost becomes like just a throwaway term. It becomes quite the discerning um, attribute of those that will end up succeeding in the future and those that don't. What's the role of trust and transparency in your brand and how you tell that story, number one. Number two, I think that um, the role of creativity is on its head and how people are creating stories. You know, one of the things that I've maintained here at Vice is that we are a community brand of curators and collaborators and creators of change. The importance of this community in how it tells the stories based on the data, based on the listening of the culture, is absolutely critical. And, and let me tell you, Daniel, these voices are going to be the voices that lead us in the future. We find those voices in unexpected places, not just through news, but through the, the very documentaries in which we commission and some of the great um, editors and creators that we team up with. All of these tell a story in the market that needs to be told. So when it comes to creativity, I think this is you know, really to the heart of it. What's the frontier for that? Um, is it to do with bringing in more voices, authentic voices into the, the way that you, um, that, that you reach both consumers and, and clients? Um, is it to do with the, uh, the media which you use, the platforms that you use to, um, uh, to, to, to get these messages across? What, what is exciting in the realm of, of, of tapping into that new creative force? I think it's in the what and the how. Um, the what comes in the form of some of the artists and the editors and the creators and the filmmakers that we team up with, right? And, you know, you know, there's a list of, of, of films and um, new projects that we're commissioning. And oftentimes the voices that we are representing are the ones that are less than popular. We have a great team of young people um, we call the 2030 Project. And they are actually working on compiling what they're seeing in the next 10 years. You know, topics like um, the importance of identity and, and, and where fluidity is. Um, the emerging changes in, in the climate, real climate change, real impact, things that they think are important. We're also investigating the importance of joy. Daniel, where do you find joy in what it is we need to do at a time we're under revolution, but we're telling the story through the eyes of people that see it in a very different way than you and I might. And, and we give a, a, a greater exposure and opportunity for those people to tell, tell their truth. And the other part of it is the medium. How are you telling the stories? You're going beyond um, the, the traditional formats of, of Insta and, 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 and YouTube and, and, and other formats and TikTok. What are new emerging formats that one might use? And so we, we have a team that's actually paying attention to what that might be, right? And so you're, you're creating new ways for people to interact with each other. Think about the, the, the um, period that we're in. Who would have thought 18 months ago, this is the primary way that we'd be communicating with each other? 
This is less of being a new normal and of more of being the new. This is the next chapter for the evolution of society. So how do we adapt to it? When it comes to those new formats, which ones are, are, are you particularly intrigued by or see opportunity in um, to, to, as, as a way of getting, getting messages across? Uh, are, there, are there ones that we're not perhaps not, or much of the world isn't yet paying proper attention to, but which is actually going to be hugely influential in the future? Yeah, I think those, I mean, I have to check with my team, but we do see emerging formats um, that are coming out with some of our partners in the East that we're exploring. Um, and I'll leave it to my team to come back to you with, with some of those details. Okay. We are testing new flat platforms and formats. When you're testing these stuff, when you're getting these authentic voices, new themes, there's always a balance um, to be struck between um, being relatively safe with your themes and being edgy and 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 controversial. So where does the where does the needle point to in that? How, wh wh what's the sweet spot for you? A little bit controversial, but not too controversial. Highly controversial, or play it safe? Well, how, how do you see that? Well, I don't think we play it safe. I think we simply tell the truth. You know, when we're um, in the middle of Charlottesville or whether we're on the Capitol, we simply tell the truth, and. Oftentimes, the truth that we tell, Daniel, is not a popular one. But that's not what Vice Media Group has built its reputation on. It's not about being popular. It's about being truthful. And again, if you point to what I said earlier about what I think is really important for brands is that truth. People are tired of the woke washing, of pretending to be authentic and throwing a words around like authentic and real and standing up for these voices when the truth is they really are not. And when you peek underneath the hood at the, the hypocrisy that exists in many of these organizations, you realize that we're simply pushing in a, an agenda. And I can tell you that Vice Media Group doesn't have an agenda. Our agenda is the agenda of the consumer. Our agenda is the agenda of truth. And when working with partners, our agenda is simply telling them what we see and what we hear. You may not like it, but we're going to tell you. You may not like how your brand is perceived, but we're not going to sugarcoat that information for you. We're going to give you the real perspective. And you talked about two things which are obviously key in this. One is trust. You've mentioned that repeatedly. The other is data and measuring. So how do you measure trust? What what metrics do you, are you particularly keen on? It's interesting you say that because we had commissioned a study on trust and we're about to commission another one. So we have an entire research group that has a trust index that they developed. And that's based on, you know, polling consumers and looking at sentiment of the marketplace. And I can follow up with you with the details of the research study we're about to commission again. It's going to be very interesting to see how trust has evolved over the last year and almost use um, 2021 as a bit of a, of a control as you reevaluate the role of trust in the next decade and in years to come. So we're just commissioning that study again. And, and I'd be curious to know how it how it shifts from from market to market you mentioned that you know it's it's not just young people it's not just all, it's and it's everywhere but is it the same everywhere or are you finding very different um attitudes or in or or, or, or cultural um uh, excitements if you like um depending on whether it's the united states which is itself changing of course as you say an inflection point but also moving into the to the east, where obviously that's a growth market for you. The preliminary views is that you might see that the young person in China may have a lot more in common with a, with a young person sitting in Brooklyn or a young person sitting, sitting in Brixton, right? They have a common distrust of what they've seen or portrayals in media, what they think is unfair. And perhaps the way forward for us as society is really understanding that what unites us is better than what divides us. And sometimes that means being able to find those common truths in an audience that will help bring us together. And Vice is in a unique position in that we are able to tap into those commonalities, those, 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 um, that, that golden thread that hold us together. So if you imagine um, that we might even commission a conference of these people, bringing them together so that they're the voices that we listen to. Those are the voices that lead us into the future. 
You know, I was talking to one of our editors at ID and she said, I remember seeing Greta before Greta was popular. And people were like, who's this person? She's just this, this, this young girl and she's going to be nobody. And they said, no, 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 she's somebody. You know, and, you know, and when you think about the fact that we always seem to be right there, anticipating what's going to happen in a Charlottesville. Take another example. I mean, Greta is one great example. Amanda Gorman now uh, bursting on the scene at the inauguration. Is this someone that you, were, you had been aware of in, uh, before that as well? We were aware of Amanda, of her growing popularity. And so you think, begin to think, if, we're not, if we know this, if our teams know it, how do we use it? Remember, being in this business is a burden and a privilege. What do you do with that superpower? What do you do with that privilege? How do you help guide? I'm not saying, we're, no one's perfect, okay? I'm not saying we're the great oracle and we open up our, our, our entire um, lens and we're like, we know everything that's going to happen. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we look at behaviors. We look at trends. We look at what people are really saying. And we say, listen to that person. Listen to the voice of an Amanda. Listen to the voice of a Greta. Listen to the voice of an Aesop. Listen to the voice of what Beyonce sang in Lemonade. Listen to the voice of so many others that we've worked with. And those voices are the ones that, that need to come through. And what I'll make sure that I do for you is send you through some of the up and coming projects that we have, um, you know, from working with Naomi Osaka to, you know, working with, you know, Maricela Escobado in Netflix, Mexico. I mean, there's so many to name of those artists um, who have a story that we can help tell. I want to come back to the idea because it's fascinating to me that you, you, you've you just been there now for a few months and you're coming to this extraordinary um, story of, 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 of vice. Uh, and, and it must be a sort of powerful uh, impression. What, what, what is most excited you and what has most scared you because you've also talked about the burden of this of this responsibility that that, that you have so i want to get a bit of the freshness of uh see, seeing it anew from uh, coming to a very different world um number one i've been most impressed with the the team here the leadership these are some extraordinary people i've worked with some pretty amazing people and i was blown away by the talent here at vice media group the sheer breadth of talent, the divergent points of views, it almost makes you dizzy with how incredible they are. Um, and then you wonder, well, why haven't we been telling this story? And, you know, sometimes in any great brand revolution and evolution, and I think that Vice is at an evolutionary period, not a revolutionary period. Some of the attributes in which I speak have always been part of our DNA. But we had to take a moment, a step back to really be very um, inward facing and reevaluate who we were as a brand, as a group of where we want to take our future. And then what they needed is an opportunity to really lean in and, and leverage their, their strong points, their reputation and trust, their history in news, the great distribution network that we have, the partners that we work with on the around the world and say, now where does that lead you? When you take a step back and look at who Vice Media Group is, you realize that the potential of this evolution of Vice Media Group is significant and that perhaps our competitor hasn't even been formed yet. That the future lies in the people and brands and the organizations that we partner with. Our future lies in the ability to tell stories that have never been told before. And our future lies in continuing to maintain you know, that, that, that grittiness, you know, that edge to how we tell it, that is maintained. But we do it with an air of integrity and transparency that we will not waver on. And that is exciting and scary at the same time. Because you got to keep this engine together. you got to keep the energy together. you got to keep this team together and keep them young and keep them inspired to go on this journey. So, so I'm fascinated that you say your competitor may not even have been formed. I'm sure you have lots of competitors already, but um, but is this sort of uh, up to a point, a, 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 a bit of a perpetual paranoia, what's needed to keep you fresh, to keep you edgy? Uh, I mean, presumably the last thing you want is any hint of complacency. We are definitely not complacent. 
I think that for those individuals that think that we have perhaps have been resting on our laurels, I think they would be sorely um, mistaken. You know, I come out of a world that, you know, I used to work at WPP and at Ogilvy, and something that um, Herta Ogilvy talked talk to me about and that we often used was this thing about divine discontent, about never, ever being happy with the status quo. That's kind of how I've always lived my life and certainly what I found here at Vice Media Group. And that has been a pleasant, pleasant surprise. But I am in a, a group of individuals that's never content with just being what we've always been. But we take what we've done and we learn from it and we grow and we get better and better and better. And I would argue that for Vice Media Group, we're going to continue to be breaking records and telling stories and developing content and developing new models that have never been done before. And I'm proud to be part of this team. Najib Bell and White, thank you very much. Good luck with this journey. I'm delighted to say Naja joins me here now. Thank you, Naja, for being the first CMO in the spotlight. We've had lots of questions come in for you, so let's um, dive straight in to the first okay. one. You've mentioned the global pandemic gives us an opportunity for a great reset. How would you like the creative industry to look in 2021 and beyond? I think the creative industry has been on this journey for, for some time. I think the pandemic probably just awoke a bit of the sleeping um, giant that's always been forming. I think we've been thinking of new ways, new platforms, um, different ways to engage consumers. Um, we have rethought the entire meaning of creativity. At a time where working virtual um, kind of has become a part of the medium and, and, and how we develop new ideas. So I think that creativity has been turned upside down. I think you're going to see some amazing work coming out of agencies and media companies, um, new emerging content, new divergent voices from all over the world in many ways is to reset the playing field creatively, not just coming from a few cities, but truly from different places around the world. What opportunities do you see in live streaming platforms and media? I think um, from, a, from a platform perspective, um, you're gonna continue to see the evolution. I mean, certainly everyone knows what, what TikTok has done. You're gonna see other emerging platforms, you know, the, the new uses of audio, you see what's happened with Clubhouse and it's, it's, it's explosion um, recently, recently. So I think that it's still evolving, it's still changing based on what you see um, consumer behavior and how consumers have adapted to the, the current circumstance of how we live. So stay tuned. I think we're going to see a lot more coming from the East than we even know about. You talked a lot about the value of your data. What are the greatest challenges associated with data that you face at Vice? Well, I think the challenge is we have so much of it, um, and it's how you interpret that data. If I think about um, the data we have across our extraordinary films, news, um, digital um, divisions, what we learned each and every day from our audiences through our agencies and our networks and people around the world. There's the data that you capture and the interpretation of that data in telling a, a truth. And I think the opportunity and challenge for, for Vice Media Group is how we mine that data, how we interpret it, the stories that we tell, and how we really partner with brands and really changing the face of culture in the future. You've mentioned Vice works with diverse creators of change. How is the way they're telling their stories changing? There's a grittiness and honesty. We have these amazing, amazing 20, 30 fellows, which are just these, I wouldn't call them kids, I'm probably dating myself, but they get together and they're really looking forward 10 years out. They talk to us about fluidity and what relationships mean to them and how they're reinventing home and um, what they look for in, in what they call authenticity, um, and not in a way that traditional brand leaders may be looking at it. Um, these young kids today have a, such a high standard when it comes to what they hold brands up to, what they think is creative, what they think is authentic, and what they think is insightful for them. And I think it's caused a lot of us to really lean in and listen quite carefully um, and really rethinking how we connect with this particular audience in a way that we've never done before. 
what are the new formats Vice is using to tell all those diverse stories that you're most excited about? I mean, we're going to continue to use new formats and in, in news. And, you know, we continue to lean into podcasts and audio um, and partner with um, different, um, you know, tech platforms in, in APAC and around the world. So we're still evolving the meaning of some of those platforms. And we still have new partners that we're looking we're looking to uh, team up with. So if you've got an idea, come talk to us at Vice Media Group. Uh, yep, you heard us say it. Um, Nadja, this is a comment, not a question. Thank you. You are so inspiring. I love Vice even more now. Smiley face. Um, what are the challenges of leading a global brand? You know, um, the challenges really are trying not to fall into the status quo. I think for Vice Media Group, our greatest challenge is our opportunity at the same time to really reinvent the modern media model. Um, I've said this before, I don't think our competitors have been born yet. What Vice Media Group is doing today is quite extraordinary. We literally learn from culture on a day-to-day -day basis. We're literally reinventing models on a day-to-day -day basis. And we do a, a lot with experimentation, which makes it such an exciting time to be here. And, um, you know, not to compare us to other tech companies, but it's like being in this amazing cultural think tank. And out, out of this cultural think tank comes new ideas, new platforms that we are on the cusp of each and every day. And that makes us an exciting partner. What are the biggest challenges for a brand aiming to help navigate what's coming next? And that's a huge responsibility, isn't it? It is. I think my best advice to CMOs and leaders is the art of listening very carefully and not be too quick to judge um, this particular generation. They've got quite a force and they've got a reason for us to pay attention to what they're saying. So listen to what the data is saying. Just don't look at the numbers, but get underneath the data. Um, how you're interpreting some of the change. How has culture um, been impacted by the current state of affairs in the world? When I talk about the great reset that's happening in the world today, much of it's being driven by the very young people in which we represent. And young is not necessarily an age uh, challenge. It's really also a state of mind as well. You've preempted my next question. Uh, well, my next question, a viewer's next question, almost word for word, which was, how can we listen more actively? Uh, but the follow on from that is, how can brands listen more carefully? You've got to have different people at the table. You know, I've spent most of my career looking at the same people at the table. And I couldn't tell you how frustrating that is. You have to be willing to embrace diverse voices, diverse ways of, of, of thinking. Um, and I've worked in, in several countries around the world and, you know, three continents, you know, at least. And I'd be always surprised how people underestimate the, the local narrative. And um, whether I'm in Africa and you're underestimating the impact of the consumers in West Africa or East Africa, or you're working in APAC and you're underestimating the impact of what you're hearing from people in different states in India or in Kathmandu, or even across Europe are looking at those divergent voices, really take the time to listen and don't be necessarily um, blinded by the prejudice or assumptions of the past. And that's something we do quite well here at Vice Media Group. We're always listening to the next and always are quite presently surprised by what they tell us. I mean, you've answered this question throughout, but just to build on it, what are you doing as a CMO to make your brand more diverse and inclusive? We're quite conscious about the types of teams that we put together. Um, I have probably one of the most global and diverse teams you know, around the world. Um, we're about to get started on a culture report that we'll be publishing at the end of the year. Um, we're going to work with teams in over 25 countries around the world to put this together. We are quite consciously probably one of the most global um, media companies um, that you'll find, not just in representation of the people we have within the group, but how we think about solving problems. I think uh, on the surface, if you look at Vice Media Group, you may think there's this company, they're based out of Brooklyn, I know who they are. If you scratch beneath the surface, you realize there's so much more than that. And that's what makes us so excited. Where are you placing your bets for marketing investments in the next six months? Oh, for me, it's all about how um, I'm mining my data and my engine. 
you know, our much of our investment right now is how we really um, take all of the data we have across our consumers and how we really mine that data, that data in partnership with brands and, and, and other partners and how we then report it back to the marketplace. So that's where we're making our investments, both in the quantitative and the qualitative. Nigel, we have to leave it there. We've had so many questions that have come in for you. Uh, thank you oh, for thank you. all of those insights. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. You all take care. Have a pleasant afternoon and evening. You too. Bye -bye. Well, that brings Bye -bye. us to a short break here on Lions Live. Take a break, stretch your legs, or if you are fired up and want to keep learning, you can check out all our films already available on demand on Lions Live. We are going to be back here in about half an hour's time where we'll be joined by our second expert guide of the day, Todd Henry, and we will have another CMO in the spotlight with Uber's Thomas Ranis. We are also going to have the first exclusive Lions Intelligence Guide session with unparalleled insights from Lion winning work to help transform your creative thinking. Finishing off the day with Lions Live Unwrapped, where Mischief's co-founder and chief creative officer Greg Hahn is going to do all the hard work for you and summarise the key takeaways from the day. I'll see you back here shortly.
Hello and welcome. I'm Tina Dehealy and this is Lions Live, brought to you with our official streaming partner, YouTube. This week is all about sharpening your creative toolkit. But what are the skills required to future-proof your career? The new Expert Guide series, sponsored by Unity, brings you big thinkers from outside the industry to shed some light on how to master the creative skills of tomorrow. Next up, we got to know him a bit earlier, it's Todd Henry. Todd is the author of four books which have been translated into more than a dozen languages. In this next piece, he leverages over 50 years of research and deep analysis of a million stories to share what truly drives creativity, engagement and brilliant work. Todd will be joining me for a Q&A straight after, so do please send in your questions as you watch along. Get your notebooks at the ready. This is Todd Henry's expert guide to discovering your creative driver. Well, hello, my brilliant friends. My name is Todd Henry, and I am the author of several books, The Accidental Creative, Die Empty, Louder Than Words, Herding Tigers, and the new book, The Motivation Code. And today we're going to talk specifically about what it is that motivates or what drives your best creative work. Now, when we talk about motivation, I think often we talk very abstractly about the concept of motivation. What does it really mean to be motivated? To be motivated means that you bring discretionary energy to your work. Discretionary energy, meaning that you're gonna spend a little bit longer doing something, you're gonna stay with a problem a little bit later than others might stay with the problem. You're gonna put more of your emotional labor, as Lewis Hyde would call it, into solving the problem. We all know that if we want to do brilliant creative work, it requires us spending ourselves on behalf of the work. We have to be willing to take risks, to try new things. We have to be willing to stay with problems far after others have given up. So the question is, where does motivation come from? How do we tap into that deep well of emotional labor, of energy to help us do our best work? Well, there are primarily three things that we rely on to do our work. The first is skills, of course. We have to have the skills necessary to do the creative work that we're tasked with. We also have to have experience, meaning that we can see nuance, that we can understand patterns, we can see reality beyond what's in front of us. We can begin to think more systemically. And that's what experience does for us. As we grow in maturity as creative professionals, we begin to see patterns that others gloss over, that others simply don't realize even exist. So skills and experience are important, but motivation is often the missing key for brilliant work. You can, of course, have in your work skills, you can have experience, but if you lack the motivation to do the work, it's going to be what I call grind work. It's work that you have to do and you do it because you have to do it, but you don't necessarily put your full energy and your full effort into it. It's not going to be satisfying work in the same way that work you're motivated to do will be. Of course, we can also have the experience we need and we can have the motivation, but lack the skills that we need to be able to produce great work. And this work is gonna be poor work. We're not gonna do high quality work if we don't have the skills necessary to deliver results. And then of course we can have the skills and we can have the motivation, but lack the experience. And frankly, this is where a lot of people who are early in their career are as professionals. We, we have skill, Maybe we're very talented and we have motivation to get it right and we understand how to tap that motivation, but we lack the experience to understand not just what we can do, but what we should do. And in this case, it will result in immature work, work that might exhibit some talent, but doesn't necessarily exhibit the kind of nuance that we need in order to be able to set ourselves apart from the competition. So skills, experience, and motivation. These are the three primary tools that we need in order to produce great work. So the biggest enigma, I think, for many of us is motivation. We know how to develop skills and we know how to gain experience, but how do we tap into motivation? So let's dive a little bit further into motivation and talk about some practical skills to help us identify what drives us. Traditionally, we have thought of motivation as primarily residing in two camps. Extrinsic motivation, meaning all of the external forces that drive us. So things like pay raises, words of encouragement, things of that nature that spur us on to act. And intrinsic motivation, which is primarily the inner drivers 
that animate our work, that keep us engaged. And we tend to, we have tended to think about motivation as uh, primarily existing of these two types of motivation that are discrete from one another. Right? So you have extrinsic motivation, you have intrinsic motivation, and they're kind of different categories. But the reality is that intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation modify one another. That the way I respond to an extrinsic source of stimulus will be different than the way that you respond because we're likely differently motivated. So you might try to motivate me with a pay raise, but I might not care about that pay raise if primarily what I want to do is be a part of a high-functioning team. That's what really animates my best work is when I'm part of a high-functioning team. Or similarly, maybe you don't care about teams and I try to put you on a high-functioning team to motivate you and you're like, just give me the money. I just want a pay raise. That's what's going to animate me because it shows that you're recognizing that I am excelling at what I do. So once we begin to understand this interaction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, it changes how we interact with one another. And especially for those of us who lead other people, it helps us lead them in a more meaningful way. So in my book, The Motivation Code, my colleagues and I analyzed over 50 years of research into motivation, over 100,000 interviews with people, and over a million achievement stories to look for patterns in how people talk about what it is that truly drives them. And what we discovered is that there's a thing called motivation code. It's the unique, sustained, unchanging drive that is the source of your deepest engagement. When you're operating within your motivation code, you will feel more engaged, you will bring more discretionary energy to the table, and at the end of the day, you're going to produce better, more sustainable work. Now, there are 27 themes of motivation that we discovered, and they live within six families. We do not have time to talk about all of those. So what I'm going to do is teach you a practical, actionable way that you can begin to get to some of these conversations about motivation uh, as kind of a shortcut. Now, we do have an assessment. If you want to take the assessment, you can do that at motivationcode.com to really identify it. But let me teach you a practical way to talk about motivation Uh, with your team or to do this on your own. Primarily, it centers around what we call achievement stories. What we discovered is that when people talk about moments of achievement in their life, a time when they accomplished something that mattered a lot to them, and then they describe that moment of achievement, it often resonates with whatever it is that truly motivates them. They're often talking about those themes that drive and animate their best work. So here's how you begin to identify your motivation code. The first thing you do is you think of a time when you accomplished something meaningful in your life. Now, it doesn't matter if it's something that was meaningful to others. It doesn't matter if anybody else even knew about it. What matters is that the moment was meaningful to you in some way. It could be something from school when you maybe you got a, a, a good grade on an exam. It could be a moment that you won a new client for your organization. It could be about a project that you created that nobody else ever saw. It doesn't matter. Think of a time when you achieve something that mattered a lot to you, that meant a lot to you, where you felt deeply engaged, deeply gratified for having achieved that accomplishment. Now, here's what you're going to do. I want you to describe what you actually did. Were you working with other people in the course of that? And was that a part of it? Um, Did you do it on your own? What were the specific things that you did to contribute to the success? Maybe, for example, maybe it was an exam that you took in school and you got a good grade on. Maybe what you did is you spent months studying for that exam and getting prepared for it. And it really was the preparation that you're most proud of. Or maybe it could be that you took the exam, but you didn't study, but somehow you managed to get a good grade anyway. But think about what you actually did. Okay, now here's what you're going to do next. I want you to describe why it was meaningful for you. Why was that particular accomplishment something that sticks in your mind, something that remains with you to this day. Can you begin to identify some of the themes within that accomplishment that were meaningful to you? Again, maybe it was that you were the one who checked it off the list and got it done, even though everybody else told you you couldn't. Maybe you had to overcome some obstacle in order to accomplish it. Maybe you were challenged in some way and you met the challenge. Maybe it was that you worked with a group of high-functioning individuals in order to accomplish it. Maybe it was that you were recognized for what you did. Maybe it was that you got to stand in the spotlight and deliver. Why was that moment especially meaningful for you? What did it mean to you in that moment? And then I want you to think about how that applies to your work right now. Are you seeing any opportunities 
in your work right now to apply those themes that mattered so much to you in those moments of accomplishment. So let's say, for example, that being a part of a high-functioning team is what motivated you in that achievement story. Are you getting opportunities right now to be part of a high-functioning team? Maybe it was that you got to present the material, but now you're kind of in a role where you're in the background. Maybe you can work with your manager to negotiate opportunities for you to be able to be in the spotlight more consistently if that's what it is that truly animates your best behavior. So when you look at these patterns, I want you to think about how did these patterns play out in my work or do they play out or do they not play out? How do they apply to the moments in my work, my current work, where I felt most engaged or least engaged? And by the way, have this conversation with your team as well. If you're a manager, talk with them about moments when they've achieved something, about the patterns in those moments and how they apply to their work right now. And then finally, and most importantly, begin to craft your role. And what I mean by this is begin to think of ways you can incorporate that motivation into your day-to-day work. Maybe, for example, it's working with a team. You need to find ways to work with individuals to get things done because that's when you're most engaged. That's when you bring your best effort to the table, right? Maybe you need to start thinking about ways that you can step into the spotlight. Maybe you need to look for obstacles or challenges. Maybe you're motivated by learning things. Maybe that's what drives those moments of achievement. And you need to find ways of learning new skills and teaching those skills to other people because that's what really animates your best work, your deepest engagement. When we begin to identify that and then bring that to what we do every single day, it completely changes the game for us and it will change the game for our organization as well as we begin to identify and tap into the unique motivations of the people on our team. You see, here's the thing. We tend to wait around to be motivated, but we have it backwards. You don't wait to be motivated. Don't wish you were motivated. You can bring motivation to your work. And when we do that, it brings deeper engagement, a deeper sense of satisfaction, and frankly, better creative output because we're going to bring more discretionary energy to our work every single day. So don't wish you were motivated. Bring motivation to your work. It's been a real joy to be with you. Thank you so much. If you want to know more, just visit motivationcode.com. Thank you so much, Todd. That was fascinating. I feel motivated to be more motivated now. And our viewers seem to have really enjoyed it too, as we've had lots of questions come in for you. I'm going to go to the first one, which is, uh, why is discovering creative drivers so important in the creative process? I, I think that we often think that creativity is like a spigot. It's like a water spigot. We turn it on, it's there. We we turn it off, it goes away. Uh, we think that creativity is something we just have on demand, especially when we're early in our career. Um, the more we experience, the more um, the more kinds of problems we solve, and frankly, the more pressure we face as a creative professional, we begin to realize that if we don't build some practices and the degree of self-awareness in our life to help us approach our work in a meaningful, purposeful, disciplined way, then we will eventually burn out. Um, I like to say that we should aim to be prolific, brilliant, and healthy in our life and in our work. Um, I think often we settle for just prolific and brilliant, and we, we burn out because we're not aware of what those creative drivers are. We're not aware of the things that uh, position us to bring our best work. If you want to be brilliant when it matters most, you must build practices and disciplines and self-awareness in the places that prepare you for those moments when you need to be brilliant. And so that's why motivation is important, because it is a sustained creative driver that continues to bring us back to our work, even when it gets difficult, even when we're facing obstacles. Um, So that kind of self-awareness as professionals, and again, We're creative professionals. You know, if we had all the time and the energy and the money and the resources in the world, this wouldn't matter because we could just create whenever we were inspired. But we don't have that luxury. We need to understand what these themes are so that we can create even when we don't feel like it because we're professionals. And that's that's why understanding these creative drivers is so critical. Someone makes a really good point here. They say sometimes... There is no time to think and reflect on what we really do. How can we find more time to reflect and discover what truly motivates us? That's a great question. Um, We all have 168 hours a week. Every single human being who has ever lived 
uh, from Marie Curie to Albert Einstein to all of the great artists that we respect and emulate had 168 hours in their week. So we need to discipline ourselves to block time for what matters. So my encouragement to you would be, and, and this is really the, the, the biggest discipline that I teach creative teams and creative professionals often, is we need to make sure there is time on the calendar for the things that matter most to us. We spend our time efficiently often, uh, but we don't think about our time in terms of investment, in terms of effectiveness. You know, we, we, with our money, we think about there's money to spend and there's money to invest that will hopefully provide a, a future return. We need to think about our time in the same way. If it's important to you to understand, to have self-awareness, to understand what drives you, uh, frankly, to develop your creative perspective, to hone your intuition, which is the most valuable asset you have as a creative professional, your intuition, then you need to block time on your calendar consistently for engaging in practices to help you hone that intuition, to help you protect that creative drive. Uh, and I know that sounds really simple, but it's very difficult to accomplish. It, it's really a matter of discipline, making sure that you are looking at your week ahead of time and blocking off some time in your week to prepare you. It might mean getting up an hour earlier. I'm sorry, I know that's not <laughs> comfortable. It might mean getting up an hour earlier, staying up an hour later, but you need to block time in your life to engage in activities that increase your potential for future effectiveness as a creative professional. Todd, another great question here. Sometimes we are too self-critical to assess our own achievements. Can yeah. you share any tips for perfectionists trying to recognize their own strengths? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. I mean, it's one of the reasons why uh, we actually developed the motivation code assessment, because it, it kind of gets at some of these motivational themes in a way that you wouldn't expect. So you don't know, how, you know the, the way that you're answering is going to lead to more accurate results because you're, you don't know what to expect when you're answering the questions. Um, but I would say, you know, in general, I meet a lot of creative professionals that struggle with perfectionism. And there's a dynamic I call expectation escalation, which is when we always expect our next project, our next bit of output to be better than the thing we just did. And that's just not a sustainable way to, to work and to live. We are not very kind to ourselves sometimes. We forget that even our best work was a process, that we had to go through a process of iteration to get to that brilliant work that we really respect now. And by the way, all of the people that we, that we love, all of our heroes, also had to go through a process to create that work that we respect and consider the, the greatest work in the world. So my, my biggest advice would be on that front, uh, we, we need to be kinder to ourselves and we need to honor process. And we need to recognize that if we are willing to engage in a healthy process and be kind to ourselves in the midst of that process, then the product is going to take care of itself. And as we look at you know our life and our aptitudes, listen, um, we we are especially now, you know, we talk a lot about having empathy for others in the midst of what we're going through right now because we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Uh, so we need to have empathy for others. Um, we need to have empathy for ourselves. We do. We don't recognize the toll that our work takes on us as creative pros. There are all kinds of pressures and pitfalls we face that uh, are often unseen to us. And so I would just encourage you, be a little kinder on yourself and also have trusted advisors in your life who can speak truth to you about some of these areas. You can describe what you're experiencing and they can reflect back to you what they hear in your words. And sometimes that's a great way to get around yeah. some of self-criticism. That's a great idea. There are so many questions coming in. I want to f uh, uh, fire them all at you, but I'm, I'm, we're probably not gonna have enough time. Um, uh, this is the next one. I believe creative leaders have a huge responsibility in motivating their teams. What's your advice for them? How can they motivate their teams better? Yeah, I think it begins with understanding the unique motivational drivers of the people on your team and then speaking to those motivational drivers. So if somebody's driven to meet the challenge, you know, like I am, that's one of my core motivations. You come to me and you say, Todd, I don't know if this is possible, but... I'm already in, right? Once you understand what those drivers are, you can speak more meaningfully to what it is that uniquely animates creative energy in that person. Um, and you won't try to motivate them in the ways that simply are a, a, a dead end because they're not going to motivate them. So I think conversation, understanding your team, and then speaking directly to those motivations uniquely to each person is the, a great first step. 
Do you believe discovering our own creative drivers is more challenging in the digital era we all live in? I dread to think how many of those 168 hours a week I'm on my phone. Yeah, we are definitely, well, the problem is I think we are in perpetual comparison mode and we are more aware. Uh, I, there's a difference between awareness and understanding and there's a difference between understanding and wisdom. I think we're more aware than ever, but I think we don't have understanding in the same way because we're constantly being bombarded by pings of external stimulus. And part of that is comparing ourselves to others. So we think we should be motivated by what motivates somebody else or what somebody else says motivates them. Um, and we're more aware of what's going on in the world uh, around us. And so I think part of getting to that real truth is just carving out the time to stop, to reflect, journaling, meditation are great tools to help you do that as well. Um, again, to protect that intuition and to protect that creative drive. Your intuition is the greatest asset you have as a creative pro. I don't care what anybody else says. It's not your skill, it's your intuition. There are a lot of skilled people who have bad intuition who cannot succeed as a creative professional. So whatever you have to do to protect that intuition is absolutely essential. That's interesting. Um, a few people want to know, so I'll combine these into one. Uh, well, I love your podcast, someone says, um, and quite a few people want to know, are you planning to write a new book? I am. I'm working on a book right now, actually, uh, and I'm very excited about this book. Um, I'm not quite ready to say what it is yet, but it is going to be daily encouragement for creative professionals to help okay. them build practices and disciplines. That will do. Um, creatives always work under lots of pressure. Time pressure is one of them. That's so paralyzing and demotivating. How can we deal with stress better? Again, I think taking uh, uh, some pauses in your day, uh, meditating, breaking away from the pressure and realizing you're not the center of the world. That's what meditation does for me. It reminds me that no matter how much pressure I'm feeling, I'm not the center of the world and those things are going to pass uh, eventually. So I would encourage people to block some time during their day to, to take a break from the pressure, even if it's 10 minutes here and there, or take a walk you know, during lunchtime or something. Where do you find inspiration when you're out of fresh new ideas? I love to, as Stephen Sample from USC called it, I commune with great minds, meaning I have a discipline in my life every day of study. Um, and that's where I find most of my inspiration is I read books, I you know, experience things, I try to put myself in positions where I'm experiencing the world in new ways or through different perspectives. And often our best ideas for our work won't come from staring at the work, it will come from somewhere out there that we least expected. So building those disciplines is, is absolutely essential of, of putting yourself in positions where you're hearing other perspectives and experiencing the world in new ways. Who was your biggest inspiration growing up? Growing up, I would have to say it was probably my father. Um, I saw him. Uh, he was a first generation entrepreneur. Uh, you know, his father and his father's father all worked jobs, which is great. That's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But my father said, I'm going to go a different way and, and started a company. And I think had he not done that, I probably would never have considered that an option for myself uh, after university. So I'd say my father was my biggest inspiration. Okay, what's the link between finding your personal and professional drivers? They're all the same. Uh, you sit at the center of your world. There's no difference between what drives you professionally and what drives you personally. So once you begin to understand those themes, it will apply throughout all areas of your life. What excites you when planning projects and content? I am very fascinated by the potential of impact for the work. Um, and so I'm, I'm typically very excited at the beginning of projects. And then once it gets into the grind of actually doing the work, that's where I have to build some disciplines uh, in my life to get it done because I, uh, yeah, I tend to hit what Scott Belsky calls the project plateau pretty quickly. Um, and I want to move on to a new idea, a new project, but I have to discipline myself to continue pushing through. Okay. And very quickly, um, in your research, have you found a connection between focus and motivation? Is lack of focus in any way connected with pursuing the wrong motivators? Yes, absolutely. And we have several PhDs on our team who've been working on that problem. Um, often, you know, our mind is going to gravitate toward the thing that is most attractive in the moment to our mind. And so if there is something that is distracting us, it's often because that thing, whatever it is, is scratching a motivational itch that we don't know needs scratched. If we can find a way to uh, bring, to structure the work we're doing 
in such a way that it scratches that same motivational itch, it will help us focus more effectively. We'll stay with it longer. And we've actually also found some degree of correlation between operating in that core motivation and experiencing a flow state or that state of sort of being deeply immersed in your work as well. So thank you for scratching our collective motivational <laughs> itch. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure having you with us. We're going thank to have you. to leave it there. Now at Lions, the focus is all about driving progress through creativity taking a closer look at what truly goes into making great creative work that pushes society, business and creativity forward. If you're thinking of entering Can Lines this year, here's a little bit of inspiration. Fourth down, coach, what do we do? I'll tell you what we do. I want you to go on the field, look for anything with an O. Let's kill them! With kindness. I think I got my fantasy nights mixed up. playing like Betty White out there. That's not what your girlfriend said. Oh, baby! Oh, 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 oh. Eat a Snickers. You get a little loopy when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. Do follow the hashtag Moments That Move The World to see more stories behind groundbreaking lion winning work. Up next is the second CMO in the Spotlight session sponsored by The Economist Group. This is your opportunity to hear firsthand what's front of mind for these leading marketers. Thomas Renice, the Vice President of Global Marketing of Uber, is next up in the spotlight. And digging into the questions that matter is the executive and diplomatic editor of The Economist, Daniel Franklin. I'm going to be joined by Thomas after the session to take all of your questions, so do please send them in as you watch along. Over to Thomas and Daniel. Hello, I'm Daniel Franken, Executive Editor at The Economist. Now, the weekly newspaper sits within The Economist Group, which works with a wide range of, of commercial clients to help them respond to the transformation around us. That's why all this week we're putting CMOs in the spotlight at Lions Live. And in the spotlight with me today is Thomas Renice, the CMO of Ubo. Thomas, welcome. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Now, Uber is, I guess, uh, a slightly unusual in that, in a way, a lot of what CMOs do is to make the brand uh, terribly well known, increase brand awareness. But when you came, uh, I guess, what, around 16 months ago now to Uber, um, awareness was almost a problem or, or you had, your, your issue was transformation. So tell us about that and what your challenge was uh, in joining Uber. Yeah, sure. It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, in fact, I often joke with the team that uh, we have a bit too much awareness. If we can take awareness down some for the brand, we might actually be able to do our jobs a little bit better. Um, but it might, it might help by starting by um, just telling you why I joined and kind of the story there, because I think it sets up the context of the challenge that, uh, that we have at hand, uh, which is so I got a call almost two years ago um, by Jill, who's our head of policy and comms, who asked me to come and see if I would talk to Dara, our CEO, and her uh, about marketing at Uber. And, uh, and I have to be quite honest that uh, I wasn't sure I was the right person for the job because I was part of the Delete Uber movement. Uh, and so I wasn't sure that they wanted me to be their, their head of marketing and their spokesperson for the brand. Um, but Jill said, you know, come, come take a second look. And this whole idea of a second look actually became a lot of what I saw as my, my purpose uh, at the company. So I was, I was convinced to join, obviously, uh, for a lot of very good reasons. Um, and I've really kind of taken on this idea that, that we need to drive reconsideration for the brand. We really do need the world to give us a second look, you know, which, you know, for a brand, as you say, which is as ubiquitous and one that is, you know, stands for a category that we invented um, and that people think they know, um, the task is quite, quite challenging to get people to really think about us differently. And I think there's a few things you have to do to do that, right? You have to, you have to be bold. Uh, big and bold, because if you increment your way there, uh, people will, will just miss miss what you're doing. Um, you need to, you know, obviously back your words with actions. You know, I, I talk a lot about um, actions, not ads, right? Because words are cheap. Uh, and if you're a company that people think they know, don't trust, 
You know, we can't come in and change the logo. Uh, that's not going to get people to think about us differently. We have to show up differently. Um, and then I think you, you have to show people we have a purpose, that we're not just about profits, that we are about people uh, and the people that we serve and, and really bring that into the heart of what you do. So I want to uh, dive into all those, but first, so what you're describing is is the challenge that you faced, which was a, a, a transforming the brand uh, identity or the brand image of, of Uber. And I guess it's, it's fallen into two phases because you arrived before the pandemic and then the pandemic happened. So let's talk about that. I mean, it, the three things that you mentioned apply before the pandemic, apply through both, in a sense. So you start off with, a, with I'm sure, a great strategy to do this, probably along the lines <laughs> you suggested, uh, and, then the pan and then the pandemic happens. So I I'd like to hear how that changed things and how these plans have had to adjust through a very changed uh, universe. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, the work that we needed to do, and in some ways, even the strategy by which we went about doing it didn't change. Uh, so I was only at the company really six months before COVID hit. So I was just getting my feet on the ground, you know, figuring out what the bathroom was, getting to know the company and the people um, when COVID occurred. And, and actually the planning for COVID started occurring in January and February. So Uber is an exceptionally operational company. When, when we saw the risks that were on the horizon, we did a lot of pretty intense planning, scenario planning on how we might show up. And so that became quite early in 2020, uh, which was super helpful. But in some ways, our work didn't change. So I think a good example of that is safety. Right? We've been committed to safety now for a number of years. We had a history of um, assaults, uh, incidents on our platform. And obviously, putting strangers in a car requires a degree of safety and trust between a rider and a driver. And so we had done quite a lot of work and actually released our first safety report at the end of 2019, showing some progress uh, on the commitments we made. And so safety, I mean, paramount during COVID, right? I mean, still a huge commitment to safety, but a redefinition of what safety means, no longer about assaults, but now about hygiene and health safety. And I quickly had to come up to speed on understanding the protocols, talking to health experts, uh, establishing the right technologies, but putting safety again front and center to the product and embedding that in our technology and in our communications and our guidelines for how people interact on our platform. So. Um, so in many ways, the strategy was very similar. Some of the content changed, but the pace changed quite a bit. I mean, in many ways, um, you know, you hate to call a pandemic an opportunity, uh, but it became a platform for us to accelerate a lot of this reconsideration that I'm talking about to help people see the way we show up now is a representation of who we are and our values, and it's not who you thought we were. And so, you know, we could have put our head down and said, we're just going to focus on getting the business back to health. I mean, our mobility business was down 80, 90 percent. Uh, at the peak of, of the pandemic. And so we could have just put our head down and said, how do we survive? But instead it was, how do we show up, right? How do you take a stand for what you believe in? How do you essentially take the responsibility of being this ubiquitous platform in cities for whether it's for people earning, whether people moving, whether how cities function and actually play a role in addressing the pandemic, which is a lot of what we end up doing. It's, it's a bit of a theme for many businesses through the pandemic that the, 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 the COVID has sort of accelerated change. And that seems to be what you're describing, you could leverage this to accelerate a change that you wanted to, to bring about anyway in the, in the appreciation of the brand. So uh, can, you give, can you give a few examples of how, you, how that worked for you? I mean, you were actually actively discouraging people from taking rides, for example, and that's not a, an intuitive thing for a ride sharing <laughs> company, but you know, that's one example. But give us, give, tell us about that and perhaps some others. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think to me, it comes back to grounding yourself, your company and your brand and in, in your purpose, right? And we're a movement company. I mean, there are, I, mean, I think if you ask consumers what they think of Uber, like we stand for movement in so many ways. And so how do you show up as a movement company at a time where the world needs to stop moving? Um, and so we very quickly launched an initiative that I called, uh, that we called Move What Matters, right? So telling people not to move, and we literally put that information quite quickly in our app, that if you were considering using us, that you need to think twice, because right now everyone needed to stay in place uh, so that we can help flatten the curve. And that's what the health authorities were telling us. And so we communicated that to, to our potential riders, but so that we could also save rides to help Move What Matters, because we still know Healthcare workers needed to get to hospitals, essential workers needed to get their jobs, and frankly, food needed to get to people who were stuck at home, whether they were seniors, 
you know, school kids, um, and we needed to help local restaurants stay afloat. So, so our whole effort was about moving what, what matters. Um, we committed 10 million free rides and deliveries to help people in need. So we partnered with the NHS in the UK to help healthcare workers get to hospitals. We partnered with the World Central Kitchen to get food to students and seniors at home. Uh, we partnered with an organization called No More to ensure that domestic violence uh, victims were able to get to shelters at this time. Um, and then we told people not to move. And, you know, I uh, might have gotten fired, but I convinced our CEO that we should run an ad on television and put paid media behind that message, which essentially said, thank you for not riding Uber, um, because that's what everyone needed to do to do our part. So, you know, we wanted to show up in that responsible way um, and in many ways, you know, act like a, 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 a public utility or what I call the citizen leader, because we are so much in the fabric of cities and how people function and wanted to make sure we were, you know, relevant and responsible. So, so wind forward to the present. I think it would be fascinating to hear how has this work, what are the results so far, both in terms of, you know, the business, um, the actual um, you know, revenues and, and, and profitability and so on, but also in terms of the, 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 the brand sentiment around Uber, how has that changed? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the fortunate thing for us is that we're a tale of two cities, we're a tale of two businesses, or in some ways a tale of two brands, because we have Uber, which is known for rides, and we have Uber Eats. And so while the mobility business was down, you know, 80 to 90% at its worst, the Uber Eats business has grown almost double in the last year. And so we were able to, uh, you know, able to manage the business because of those two, two different uh, uh, product offerings. It also meant we could show up in different ways. So we were doing as much to try to help to drive demand for local restaurants. We launched an eat local effort in the early days as well with zero delivery to make sure that people were, um, you know, uh, supporting their local businesses and having food delivered to their homes so that they can stay open, which is something we've returned to again uh, this year. Um, so, so that helped us get through this and also leverage all the, the um, possibilities of our platform to, to, to play our part and, and to drive, drive the business. Um, look, I, I think, you know, transformation, as you called it, takes time. You don't turn a brand around, particularly one that is that cemented in people's minds overnight. Uh, I think COVID gave us an opportunity to start accelerating that. And the good news is we're starting to see that. I mean, anecdotally, we're getting much more positive response to the way we've shown up and hearing stories amongst our employees, as well as our external stakeholders. And right, that matters as much as anything is to engage your employees, particularly at a time like this, that they feel that their work is, is meaningful and mission driven. Um, but we're starting to see some of our metrics move. I mean, our safety metrics went up, uh, particularly around commitment to, to safety and hygiene practices. And we saw in a number of places, our driver satisfaction either stay flat, which was a good thing, or go up in some places. So some indications, but I won't tell you our job is done. This is a very long you know, journey. What about the broader measurements of brand perception? I'm sure you measure that too. Uh, yeah. has, the needle so has the needle shifted? That's probably the slowest to move, right? From the, the, the actual yeah. hard metrics that you talk about to the perceptions of brand. These, as you say, doesn't happen overnight, but do you see any, any sign of that shifting? So we've, we've done a lot of uh, analysis on what drives favorability is what we call it internally. And there are three key drivers, safety, um, a treatment of our, of our earners or our drivers and our corporate actions. And so some of the things, some of the leading indicators are what I just talked about, movement and the commitment to safety, driver satisfaction. Um, you know, what we saw is when we showed up with some of these initiatives, whether it was our social impact initiative of 10 million free rides and deliveries, some of our advertising and communications, the response did start to move the needle on brand favorability. Now, sustaining that, I think, is the hard work um, because you have to continue to show up that way and hopefully see the needle move over time. And, I, you know, having worked at Google for a decade and looking at a lot of metrics around brand trust, that takes some time uh, to move. And I, I don't expect that to move for, for years, really. OK, I'd like to talk a little bit now about the creative aspect of this and, you know, how a lot of what you've been describing actually is sort of leveraging, you've used that word a lot of the, the circumstances, um, is creative. You have to move quickly. I, I presume you have, to, you have to do unexpected things. But how has, that, how has the creative process for you uh, evolved over this period? And, and how does that point towards the future? I mean, in, in many ways, it was quite exhilarating from a creative standpoint. I mean, those first few months, because you felt like there was such 
meaning and purpose to the work you were doing that I think it was quite energizing, but you had to work very differently, as you say. Um, I was also rebuilding my team in this this year. So 2020 was meant for me to be a year of kind of building the fu fundamentals of the marketing function at Uber, you know, doing some of the work that I talked about, but really putting in place the foundation for work that I thought was going to be, you know, forthcoming. Um, and so through all of this, I was hiring, a, I hired a new executive creative director. I've never met her yet in person. Uh, we interviewed her by Zoom. She started by Zoom. We work collaboratively and famously now together by Zoom. So all of this kind of in the middle of the pandemic, which was, as you can imagine, everything we were all, we've all been going through as humans and as teams has been challenging. But, um, you know, we, we ended up producing some of the work that I just talked about, like the thank you for not writing spot in, in like three days. We went and shot that by putting a brief out to creatives who were stuck in their own homes to shoot their own footage to then bring that back together and edit it into, into the spot that ran. We did a spot several months later um, around our policy of no mask, no ride. So taking a stand for safety and the importance of wearing masks as a way to keep each other safe. I mean, the team created that literally in 24 to 48 hours. Um, so the speed of working and relying on remote forms of, of editing and, and shooting and collaborating, um, I have to say, has, has worked far better than I think we ever imagined. I'm not sure we want to always work that way, but it has created a certain sense of ingenuity and, and agility that I think has been pretty, pretty phenomenal. It sounds like a sort of responsive creativity that you're describing there, where you, you, you speed up, you're able to move with a, with a, with a changing env external environment uh, very fast. Is that becoming the norm, do you think? Is that the way of the future? I think that's a great question. And one of the things I've talked a lot about with my team over the last year is I feel like what we're doing now is real-time marketing. You know, I think we've, I mean, the digital world had already sped things up to a certain degree, but the pandemic, I think, kind of put it on steroids, right? I mean, the, the ability to create work quickly, to respond to the moment, really quickly to also pivot when your, re your response or your communications is not relevant anymore. And a, and a good example of that is when we were ready to launch this no mask, no, no ride uh, communications in spot. It was actually the week the protest to George Floyd broke out in the United States. Uh, so the message of safety and mass did not seem relevant at that point in time. So we had to pull that and quickly figure out how do you show up now? Like, how do you continue as a movement brand to take a stand for the fact that not everyone feels like they can move and there's fear, particularly if you're black in this country, being able to move. And so we you know, quickly took a stand on that issue and showed our support for the movement and for fighting racism. But so I think, I think, I don't know if that's going away. I mean, there's some of that being really responsive and in the moment that also helps a brand stay alive, stay fresh, feel human and accessible and reachable. And I think those are good things. And, and in that process, is it um, uh, working internally uh, where often you can work fastest or working with agencies, uh, we're outsourcing it? There's an, extra, there's an extra layer in that, but everybody's busy in, in, your, own, in your own shop. So what's the optimal uh, arrangement there, and how have you how how have you changed the way you've worked with your with your agencies? Yeah, I think it's always going to be a mix. I mean, I think uh, this has been a trend that's been happening for many years. But having a healthy uh, and very talented in-house team, I think, allows you to do work that is um, you know truly born from the brand. Because the only way to really know a brand is to kind of be within the DNA of a company. Uh, so I think that part is critical and having, you know, creative leaders and talent in house, but then working hand in hand with agency partners. And I think they're also critical because they bring a fresh eye and a perspective and an outside in view that challenges you. And so, but working collaboratively. And so, you know, a lot of the work that I talked about in the early days of our response to COVID, we did with Wyden and Kennedy and we worked hand in hand in effort. I mean, hand in hand. I mean, there were nights I remember being on Zoom with some of the best creative writers in the world, you know, helping to edit a print ad together where we're literally in a Google doc, you know, editing this thing, uh, which I'm not sure would have ever happened, uh, you know, before COVID and their respect and patience for me to help edit something was <laughs> quite appreciated, but it, I think got to much better work faster as well. And so I, I don't know, we're trying to think about how do we bring that forward in our agency working model, right? Where it feels like we're one team uh, versus sort of like a brief and a pitch and response kind of thing. And you talked, to, I think it was in your first response, you talked about action, not ads. But what you're describing seems to me to be something rather different. It's almost action and ads, right? You're, 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 you're mm. describing doing actions and then making ads, ads about those actions. Is that, is that a fair 
description? I think that's fair. I just, I think I would put the emphasis on the action because I think the ads can be cheap, right? And not necessarily believable. But, but I think there's a great example of, I think, where ads were actually action or what I would actually say advertising was activism. So some of the ways that we showed up to support the um, Black Lives Matter movement this summer, and you know, again, you know, we, we responded very quickly during the protests of George Floyd by showing our support for the movement. We were one of the first tech companies to donate to organizations like the Equal Justice Institute and others. But more importantly than that, really sort of said, look, if you, if you um, tolerate racism, you're not welcome on the Uber platform. And then we did a lot of soul searching on just how do we as a company make sure that we're doing the work in-house as well as taking a stand uh, in the community. And so we announced in July a number of anti-racism commitments that included like doubling our black representation and leadership, full, full equity and pay, but also bringing more inclusivity into our product roadmaps and development, um, supporting black owned businesses in the community and making sure that our guidelines were clear that if you, you know, if you behaved a certain way, you were not welcome on our platform. So all that to say, when we got to the, the March on Washington, at the end of August that the National Action Network was, was sponsoring, we partnered with them uh, to show up in the, in the marches. And so we put billboards um, in DC, uh, moving billboards as well as static ones, and in, and in cities around the country that were supporting the movement that said to lead Uber if you tolerate racism and that black people have um, the right to move without fear. And we wanted to take a stand. If you were in our app and you didn't approve our, our guidelines, you, you were not welcome. We actually also shared with you information from the ACLU about the right to march because we wanted people to know they had a right to, to, to be there uh, and to be there without fear. But I guess it's all to say, the billboards were not meant to be advertisements. They were meant to be a stand, a stand, right? And a show of support. And in some ways help Uber show up then and to be in, in some ways as much activism as advertising. So, you know, where's the line between action and ad in that case? Um, but I think, you know, your general point is right. We want to communicate what we're doing, but we want to make sure it's behind, there's substance behind it. Well, it links in, I think, very much to where I, what I wanted to ask you next, which was about the internal transformation, because it's all very well to do these, uh, these campaigns and to make uh, to make to make uh, to put out messages about them, but the, the hardest thing is always the internal trans transformation of a of a company. And and you, yours was a company that had a very very strong uh, culture right from the top, set from the top. And clearly, new CEO comes in and wants to change that. Um, how does that filter through to the marketing function? You talked about changing your team, hiring new. A uh, whole new team for yourself. How have you said about that, and how's it going? Well, first I have to say, you know, one of the things that convinced me to join the company was that a lot of the toxicity, I think, and the culture that you're referring to, that that I think has been famous for Uber, or maybe infamous for Uber, has been cleaned up. And I was really impressed by Dara and his leadership and his vision, his humanity. Uh, and what he had done to sort of bring that back to the leadership team of the company and really address a lot of the issues in the culture. So that was the first thing I needed to feel comfortable with before I, before I joined the company. Um, and, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, having spent now the last year and a half at Uber, is the intent and the commitment and the conscientiousness is, is not just at the top, it's throughout the company. It's a very mission-driven company, um, like many companies. Um, and the employees really do have their heart in, in doing the right thing, as Dara says, and, and making sure that we're bringing that, you know, from our tech to our ops to our marketing. So I think the context of that's important. Now we need to continue to nurture that and define that. And, and that's a lot of why I see the role of marketing internally to help do. And so my job is to be to hire marketers who can help that show up, right? And 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 you know, thinking about the brand even outside in before I got here is to bring a lot more humanity and heart to a brand that has been seen as a bit maybe uh, brash and bold without necessarily appreciating the, the fact that we're a digital company that actually empowers people to do things, right? Like a, a human being drives another human being to a place. So while we're a tech platform, we're actually this important physical brand in people's lives. And so how do we bring more of that humanity and empathy? So I've hired people uh, with different backgrounds, you know, just to come kind of refresh the, the vision for the team. I mean, a lot of the marketers at the team on, that, I, that I arrived uh, at Uber and, and found were incredible and had that soul. It's just a matter of giving them an opportunity to express it and then bringing in different points of views and people from different industries to help us just uh, come at the work from a, a slightly different point of view. I'm sure it's an, it's an extraordinary time that you've been living through with, with uh, you know, layer of, of transformation with a pandemic. I'm sure case studies will be written about it. What, 
what have you learned through all this and you know what is relevant to um, the wider world of marketers do you think I think one thing is the humanity in what we do you know I think that's maybe an obvious thing but I hope the world takes from the last year how connected we are as human beings and connected to each other and connected to the planet and I think it has helped me see that as a leader, that's an important element in how I want to show up and how I need to show up. But as marketers, I think that's just an important part of our job is to bring the humanity and the empathy um, to things, to anything a company does, no matter what your product and service is, because at the end of the day, your customers, whoever they are, whatever industry are, are the human beings. And how do you help kind of connect to them and connect your product and services in a way that are relevant to their lives. So, you know, I hope we come out of all this with a renewed sense of humanity and connection and trust. There are many days I'm not so hopeful when I watch politics, but I'm, I'm hoping brands can play a role in that. And I, I think of the Uber platform as, as in some ways, a, um, I think an interesting model for that, as I said earlier, because, you know, over this tech platform, we actually do connect strangers, right? We connect a stranger who is a driver to a rider. We connect a a small business to a delivery to someone's home and like that human connection and the trust that's required, I think is critical. So how do we as marketers foster that and celebrate that and kind of bring that through from the big things we do that I talked about to the little things, right? Whether it's an email to someone and just how does that communicate and reach people or how you develop the product to be much more thoughtful about the lives that people are having. Um, so I don't know, I think, I mean, that to me is the biggest thing. It may not be about agility and marketing though. I think that's really important, right? And some of those lessons, I think there's about how do you stay close to the user? And we did a lot of very intense, very frequent and rapid consumer research throughout this phase, which I hope we bring that forward so you stay relevant and close to just changing lives. Um, there's real-time marketing and the way you work. I mean, all those things I think are going to be quite interesting when you think about marketing as, as an industry and a profession, but it's the humanity beneath it or the empathy that I think is the most powerful. Well, it's been quite a ride, if I can use that expression. And, and uh, thank you for sh <laughs> sharing it with us today, Thomas Renice. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Thank you, of course, to Daniel Franklin at The Economist Group for conducting that interview. Thomas Release joins me now in the studio for a live Q&A. Thomas, thank you for joining us. We have lots of questions lined up for you. The first one is, what are the current marketing trends you are most excited about? Oh, that's a great question. And thank you again for having me. Um, and I will be drinking my coffee as it's a bit earlier here on a Monday morning. Um, I think there's two things for me. One is this renewed sense of brands playing a purpose in people's lives and really thinking of themselves as even um, you know, bigger and, and broader than just the, the product and services they deliver, but the role they play in people's lives um, and helping to guide people through challenging times. So I think renewed sense of purpose and, and reminding people the values um, of, of the lives that they live and how brands can be connected to that. So I hope that doesn't go away. I hope that's something we take forward um, from the, the last year and a half and, and how brands have had to show up during the pandemic. Um, you know, I think the second one is, is this idea of agility um, and be, being able to be real time in people's lives. So brands that can truly reflect the moment and certainly the last 10 or 15 years in the age of, of digital marketing has allowed brands to be, you know, even more current. Um, but I think the pandemic and the, the experience we've all shared over the last many months has caused brands to have to show up in even more kind of immediate terms. And I think bringing that forward and staying really connected to people on a minute to minute, day to day, week to week basis, so you can be truly relevant, I, I think is the other trend that I hope to see marketing really embody going forward. What are the next steps in 2021 and beyond? You're planning to make Uber even more human as a brand. Um, great question. And we have, we have work to do. It's a journey, uh, that we're on. Uh, so at the very beginning of the pandemic, I think you heard me talk about, we made a commitment to 10 million rides and deliveries of food to people in need so that we could help move what matters while the world stopped moving. Well, our recent initiative that we launched as the world is really thinking about moving again, finally, um, with, uh, um, the rollout of vaccines across the world, uh, was a, a commitment we just made also really about what move what matters, which is a, a commitment of 10 million rides uh, for people in need to get to the vaccines. Because we know that unless everyone gets the vaccinations, unless we get 
is something like 85 percent vaccinations in our communities, um, you know, none of us can really move safely again. And so how do we really help those who perhaps are most challenged um, to get the vaccines? And the role that we can play is removing the transportation barrier um, to vaccinations. And in fact, one of the key determinants of health care and health care inequity in, in, our, in the U.S. anyway is transportation believe it or not. Um, and so helping people get to clinics and pharmacies and other places that are distributing the vaccines, and particularly if you're in a community of color, black communities of color, uh, low income communities, seniors. And so we're really focused on this right now um, for the next, you know, however long it takes, but certainly for the next six plus months and partnering with folks like Moderna and Walgreens, PayPal, which we've announced last week, as well as with a lot of NGOs around the world. Uh, to make sure they're really, truly doing our part to get the world moving again. What was the initial reaction of your employees, the drivers, to the new campaign you've mentioned, Thank You For Not Riding? Yeah, so that was the campaign we launched in the very few first weeks um, of COVID back in March and April. Um, you know, I think it, it was a controversial uh, message for sure, uh, starting with convincing our CEO to run ads, telling people not to use our products. But um, obviously our drivers very much depend on the earnings that they get from, from driving. Um, but I think they too were very concerned about safety and trying to figure out how to protect their own safety uh, as well as continue to earn a living um, as they needed. And so I think the message landed well when we helped drivers um, take care of themselves. That is, and it took some time, right, to provide them the PPE they needed to, to ride, um, to uh, offering them uh, some financial support if they were exposed to COVID so that they can quarantine for 14 days and keeping them informed about all the things that the company was doing, but also providing them information from healthcare authorities on how to keep themselves safe, particularly in those first few weeks, if you remember, when information was lacking and everyone was trying to figure out what to do. So helping them uh, address their concerns as we launched that message, I think was an important part of helping them be comfortable uh, with the campaign. You've mentioned responsive creativity as a huge opportunity for brands. What's the most rewarding part of that and what are the biggest challenges here? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I think the, to me, the most rewarding part of this has been a really close collaboration that has to happen in order to do work like this, in order to do work at the speed um, that I think the world is demanding. Um, you know, working really closely internally um, with everyone from product and business to obviously all of the marketing creatives, but also collaborating really closely with their agencies um, day in and day out. And so changing that relationship so that it's no longer brief and go away and then hear ideas, but actually getting in the trenches together, so to speak, um, and mining for insights and really thinking about how to bring the best out of the creative work. I think to me, that's one of the most inspiring parts of, of that work. Um, it's, it's hard for sure. And particularly when you're all stuck on these little Zoom screens and you can't actually get in a room and whiteboard or um, you know, kind of create other forms of energy to, to spark that creativity. Um, but I think the, the collaboration um, that's required to me is one of the things that's most inspiring. We've got Uber Ride, Uber Food, Uber Two Wheels. What's next on the horizon? Can you shed some light on what the future holds for your brand? Yeah, you know, I think um, Uber really aspires to be a, a brand that people can use every day and making their lives uh, a, bit, a bit easier, a bit well, maybe more effortless. Um, and so thinking about how we actually stitch all of those things together to be a platform that lets people go anywhere and get anything and do that with the ultimate sense of reliability and convenience um, that allows people to unlock time in their day uh, and connect the dots um, to do the things that really matter to them. So really just figuring out how we bring all those things together in a more seamless way so we can truly help people navigate their everyday lives. I think that's really where we're heading. Um, and I think the innovation comes from making all of that work just even more seamlessly and together. We are out of time, but I do want to ask you one final question. So uh, a quick response, if you would. Where do you see the world of marketing in the next 12 months? And what can we do to prepare ourselves now for times ahead? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I know to answer very quickly. Sorry. <laughs> that's OK. I mean, I think the world is going to crave more experiential and real world 
marketing. If you, you know, and maybe even buck a bit of the trend of digital marketing and everything we've seen from the last year, the, the, the need for connectivity and physical connectivity and real world connectivity and what role can brands and marketing play as the world gets moving again and gets back out living. I think that's going to be an interesting space. Thank you so much. A bit of feedback to finish. It's been quite a ride, Thomas, pun intended, I'm sure. Uh, thank you so much. You're such an inspiring brand leader. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. Now, up next, we have the first of three exclusive Lions intelligence guides. With unique insights from Lion winning work, these films provide you with the best practice examples to build your creative capabilities. With increased levels of market disruption at an all-time high, Brands have to constantly adapt and be more agile than ever. Well, this next session explores lessons from Lion winners on how brands can engage with fast-changing local markets. Get ready to transform your creative thinking with the Lion's Guide to Localism. Welcome to the third in a series of Lions Intelligence Sessions made exclusively for Lions Live. We've drawn on 67 years worth of unique Can Lions data to identify patterns in the winning work that will support you in building your creative capabilities. But why localism? Localism describes a shift in consumer preference towards brands that are geographically close and often those which reflect the specific needs and behaviours of local communities and markets. But localism of course isn't new. Consumers have been increasing conscious of quality and sustainability and buying locally often correlates with buying ethically. In May 2020, research firm Kantar found that COVID-19 has driven a surge in localism around the world, with two-thirds of consumers now preferring to buy goods and services from their own country, while 42% overall said they now paid more attention to the origin of products. Even those who are emerging from lockdowns have a renewed commitment to their local communities and displaced city workers will continue to spend more time in their local areas. There is something incredibly powerful and human about a very specific local insight. As Luis Sanchez, Outdoor Lions jury president in 2021, talked to us about in the first Lions Live. What happened in Italy in the lockdown? Everybody watch what the, those guys are singing in the balconies of their houses. They, you know, that travels the world, you know, of course, through the digital channels. But in fact, that was an outdoor event that was happening. And people love that and share that. So that's my point. Let's bring flavor, the uniqueness of something that happened in a local scale. So from local to global, I think that's uh, one of the messages that we, are, we really have to dig now and seek for this. This is a differentiation in this new world. So in our current context, global brands are having to rethink their strategies and take the global and fragmented to local and holistic. At Can Lions 2019, we heard a rallying cry for creatives around the globe to lean into local culture and bring a resonance and distinct personality to their storytelling. Here's Scylla Levin, CEO of Forsman & Bodenfors Stockholm and David Guerrero, creative chairman of BBDO Guerrero Manila, talking about the role of local insight in powerful creative. I, I think that the, the um, culture, wherever it comes from, is a great uh, treasure chest for creativity. Yes. I mean, you don't even need to come from that uh, country specific to find it. We are in a great position to be culturally sensitive and, and, and to bring creativity in, you know, to sort of, I say, you know, draw on local culture yeah. and, and use that as, as sort of raw material for, for, for creativity. And I think that's, that's where originality and relevance comes from. First introduced in 2019, the culture and context categories sit across 10 lions and were created to recognise the rise of culturally specific creative work, and it's where we've seen this trend most prominently. The jury considers the strength of the creative in relation to local and cultural insights, challenge a brand strategy or breakthroughs on a budget, all features of localism. 8% of all of 2019's trophy wins at Cannes Lions and 13% of shortlisted entries, including the Media Lions Grand Prix, were culture and context entries, showing this is a popular and award-winning type of work. 
Almost 70% of these trophies were awarded for work that was local to the specific region, country or location where it was aired, while the remainder were awarded to work for global brands for a local spin. We've dug deep into 85 Lime winning pieces of work from six continents and identified four insights that might help you think about how to embed local thinking into your creative capabilities. Amplifying local pride. Finding a specific local point of pride, whether it's behavioural or cultural, emotionally moving or simply funny, is a key factor for success. 24% of culture and context winning entries galvanise communities to celebrate their local area and feel a sense of pride and belonging. 69% of local pride work was for work promoting local brands, with around half specifically encouraging consumers to buy local, and the remaining work was from global brands who leveraged local pride to increase brand affinity. For a local dairy brand, Texchest Vlogs won a bronze line for bringing local stories to online communities who would have never have known them otherwise, earning an 11% increase in sales value. And Where You Belong for Russian airline Uter increased sales by 5.2%, challenging the belief that a foreign holiday is more socially acceptable than visiting your homeland. But let's take a look at brand experience and activation bronze line winning Philly Forever, which connected with consumers in creative and original ways specific to the city of Philadelphia, yielding a 1.8% increase in market share in Philadelphia, which is over 2 million more Bud Lights sold. The Philadelphia Eagles were not supposed to win the Super Bowl. The franchise had never won a Super Bowl before and they were a 50 to one underdog at the start of the 2017 season. So when Eagles lineman Lane Johnson offered up this promise, I'm giving out beer to everybody. it made all the sense in the world to jump on board and offer to cover the tab. Then something magical happened. The Eagles started winning and the team embraced the brand and the brand embraced the team. Dilly Dilly became Philly Philly. The entire city of Philadelphia turned Dilly Dilly into a rallying cry as their underdog football team was making a run to the Super Bowl. And then, the team turned this rallying cry into the Super Bowl winning play. Ultimately, we created a campaign that will never end. A campaign that did more than sell beer, like two million more beers. We created a rallying cry for an entire city. One that will stand enshrined in bronze for generations to come. I'll say it only once. Philly, Philly! Apply a hyperlocal lens. 46% of culture and context winning campaigns were hyperlocal. That's designed for a clearly defined audience in a specific region or location and often hinging on very specific cultural or behavioural insight. These campaigns build authentic communication, often through strong social engagement, leading to tangible sales uplift. It's interesting that traditional mediums are often used for hyperlocal work, with 44% of the campaigns we analyse using out of home as a significant channel, and 26% using radio. Hyperlocal out of home advertising is a natural option when people are confined to a small local area, building intimacy with consumers who interact in real life and in real time, producing amazing user generated content along the way. The Media Lions Grand Prix, which won for social behaviour and cultural insight, was Air Max Graffiti Stores. It tapped into the local graffiti culture using geolocation, increased local social engagement by 22%, and local sales by 32% in Brazil. The Parisian Rendezvous increased in-store foot traffic by 50% by hijacking the GPS in self-service scooters to drive consumers directly to the store. And let's take a look at Russian prices for supermarket Plaza Vea, winner of Peru's first ever Gold Lion in PR. The campaign engaged an extremely niche audience, the handful of Peruvian football fans who travelled more than 14,000 kilometres to see their national team play, but the brand reached 4.88 million people and drove sales up by 7.5%.
принять всех болельщиков из Перу. Им только нужно предоставить паспорт на кассе. Local community at the core. Whether online or offline, bound by location, interest or situation, loyalty and value are unlocked when brands engage communities. And in 2019, 65% of culture and context winning work centred around local community. Hashtag Cognation for Activision set out to change the perception of Call of Duty players by writing, directing and editing hundreds of social films made from inside the game all celebrating players' true personalities, and it was the best-selling video game in the US in 2018. And Scenting the Hope of Change increased the brand's market share by 1.6% by launching Glade's first ever culturally scented fragrance, recognising the pivotal moment of societal change taking place for Saudi women. But the double bronze lion winning open shelves for writers' bookstores saw local influencers and celebrities open their bookshelves and share their recommendations, generating a staggering 910% uplift in online sales for the store. The store manager, Janos, asked famous literature lover friends to virtually donate their private bookshelves to them. Many public figures who liked the writer's shop because of the cultural atmosphere magically joined his initiative. More and more writers, musicians, actors, chefs and journalists happily opened their home's door and heaps of new customers bought new books through their virtually open bookshelves and recommendations. Örülök, hogy ennyi irodalom kedvelő csatlakozott a nyitott polcokhoz. És nem gondoltam, hogy benne leszünk a tévében is. Az élet mégiscsak ezt a koncepciót igazolta, hogy, hogy létrehozni egy közösséget, meg nagyon az irodalomra figyelni, hogy az kifizetődő dolog. Challenge the status quo. 37% of culture and context winning work was for challenger brands who produced disruptive and game-changing work that challenged the status quo in the market. In Kyrgyzstan, online news organization Kloop campaigned against the kidnapping of brides in the gold lion winning Kashogo. A powerful symbol of traditional marriage was blended with taboo stories of violence against women. The campaign drove an increase in reports from Alakachu victims of 23%, and as a result, 26 police officers were discharged from duty or severely punished. Do Black, the carbon limit credit card, is the first card with a CO2 emission limit. It stops you from overspending, not based on the money you have, but the environmental impact of your consumption. And Fly With Us saw airline Fly Bondi cleverly challenge the spending habits of Argentine politicians whilst also increasing both awareness and sales. It won three bronze lions in brand experience and activation, outdoor and social and influencer. Fly With Us, an invitation to fly low cost and help the country cut public spending. We launched a campaign of tweets and digital posts directly addressed to the congressman. spread videos explaining the initiative that quickly became viral. We also launched a campaign of posters around and across from Congress. And special billboards comparing current airfares with what legislators would save by flying with Flybondi. And suddenly, a message to 329 people reached the millions we had hoped to reach. So why do some local pieces of work win at local award shows, but not global ones and vice versa? Well, it's largely due to cultural context. When you submit your work, please be sure to explain how you arrived at your insights and why the execution was relevant and meaningful to your chosen community, sector and region. Can Lions juries are international and there are many juries for whom English is not their first language. So have in mind how you'd explain your work to someone from France or Mexico or Egypt because those are the people in the room. For this work, you need to spend more time explaining the context than the brief. Here's the 2019 PR jury president, Michelle Hutton, fresh out of judging at the festival, reflecting on the importance of cultural context. Your work is going to be judged by people from all corners of the world. So understand that cultural context is extraordinarily important. You know, we had a lot of discussion in the room when cases were presented and there were often it was often the case that 
some of the jurors literally didn't really understand the power of the idea. So we had to sometimes stop and explain. So think very carefully about how you present your work. Make it really simple to understand. If there is a really important local market nuance that's critical, make it clear and easy to understand. So that's that. I hope you've enjoyed this third session in our Creative Guide to Survival series. Please do check out the other episodes on how to recession-proof your work and lo-fi creativity on lovethework.com, where you can also find all of the work featured in this film. The work is our learning and intelligence platform that features over 200,000 pieces of work, as well as 1,600 talks from a decade of Cannes Lions. And if you have work you think can compete on the global stage, Cannes Lions is now open. Please do get in touch if you need help getting started. We'd love to hear from you. This is Lions Live. I'm Tina Dehealy. Thank you for joining me for today's live broadcast brought to you with our official streaming partner, YouTube. And what a day it's been. We've heard about localism, being brave in uncertain times, fostering curiosity, discovering your creative drivers, as well as hearing what's front of mind for global marketers. Well, to help us pick out some of the key points and takeaways, I'm now joined by the co-founder and chief creative officer of Mischief, Greg Hahn. Greg, thank you for joining us. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, what did you make of today, first of all, your overall impressions? It was, today was really great. I mean, I thought today pulled out some really interesting insights from a year of being in the pandemic. You know, we've been doing this for almost a year right now, since lockdown. And a lot of the themes that came up this today were themes that we've heard a lot about over the last year, but having some perspective on it, gave it a whole new, um, a whole new light and also added some value to the, to, to what we can do with what we've learned and what, what, what's happened to us over the last year or so and really progress instead of, um, you know, retract. You are a multi-line winner, former chief creative officer of BBDO New York, setting up your own agency last summer. So hopefully a lot of what you saw personally resonated with you. Oh, 100%. Yeah. A lot of those themes you've talked about and we'll talk about now are uh, themes that I, could, I you know, have learned myself over the year and will take to heart after watching some of this stuff. OK, so let's get into uh, your key takeaways. You've watched all of today's content, I hope, and pulled out five key takeaways for us. What's your first one? Well, the first one came from a Madonna Badger who spoke about bravery. And again, that that's a that's a topic we've heard a lot about this year because, you know, as she mentioned, like uncertain times, you know, call for some some new form of bravery. There's there's fear in the unknown, and we've certainly been dealing with the unknown over the last year, and you know, not knowing what tomorrow's going to bring, let alone, you know, how to plan for a year of creativity. And the important the important lesson I learned there is there is peace in letting go of that fear. So for us as an agency, we, that's that's been a founding principle of ours has been um, take fear out of the room. You know, when I when I first um, hooked up with with No Fixed Address, which is the agency we're sistered with, you know, I went on their website and there was a, there was a line on their website that greeted you when you first logged on, and it just simply said, "What would you do if you weren't afraid?" And I just felt that it was so liberating. And, and Madonna's talk was, was, was sort of the reminder of that. Like, 
there's such freedom in not being afraid and admitting that you are afraid. When you show work to um, to clients, when you show work to other creatives, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable space. But you kind of have to let go of that because the really good stuff only happens if you're a little bit afraid. So I thought I thought um, you know really useful, a really good way to uh, you know to put perspective in on the last year. Takeaway number two. Uh, there, another, again, another topic that is, uh, we've heard a lot about is, uh, and has become super important over the years, trust. Cause when the world is like upside down, you need someone to turn to, you need to know who is telling you the truth. And, uh, this, this comes in, you know, a global sense of like, you know, not just woke up, you know, on behalf of vice, who is a, a news source. So yes, we need to know a trusted news source and, and, but also when it comes to like dealing with everyday people and in the work you do for us as as an agency and, and really important to 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 understand that clients need to hear the truth and the truth isn't always pretty but it, there's value in people that will tell you when something is wrong or when something's off or what you should be doing even if it's something you don't want to hear so the, the big takeaway there is um you know truth isn't always pretty but it's very important your third key takeaway uh, yeah, this, um, well, I think the, the third key takeaway is uh, really pulled from this talk about curiosity, which Greg Worm spoke about. And he, he mentioned uh, curiosity as the gateway drug to creativity, which I thought was great. I you know, really liked that way of putting it. And his thought was that um, curiosity is like the key value that um, really defines us as humans, the way we think. Curiosity is basically what separates us from machine learning. You know, machine learning just doesn't know enough to ask the right questions or any questions. So his advice, you know, Greg's advice to, uh, to the audience was find things that raise your curiosity because curiosity is where your passion is. So it's, it's like a, a chain reaction. Find things, something that makes you curious. Find something that will lead to your passion and that will lead to better work. So, you know, one really actionable way to do that is to um, you know, ask open questions of your teams, of, of your clients. Like, instead of yes or no questions, ask things like, has it always been done this way? Or, like, what's a better way to do it? Or, um, you know, certain things like, why can't this be better? You know, just things that open discussion and open up your curiosity, you start to pull different strings in different areas, and that will lead to some, something you uh, probably didn't expect. That's a great way of interpreting it, curiosity being your passion, because, you know, some, I used to think that curiosity, well, depending on who you are, you have different levels of, of, of curiosity. So finding your passion is a really good bit of advice. Um, what other takeaways do you have? Well, kind of related to that, Todd Henry spoke of motivation, and I thought the way he put it was really interesting, because if you think about, like, what drives the best work, it's usually something people are motivated and passionate and feel personally invested in. So how do you find those moments and how do you create those moments? Uh, he had a great definition of, of motivation and that is um, motivation is what you spend your dec discretionary energy on. So it's the kind of work that you would do if nobody was paying you or that you kind of have to remind yourself of, uh, you know, it's time to quit. That's how you know when you're motivated. So, you know, those, those things aren't easy to come by, but you can, you can funnel your your attention towards those if you if you sort of understand what motivates you. A really a really good question that he brought up was, you know, uh, when was the last time you truly felt so, did something you were proud of, and what led to that? And that's often where you'll find your motivation. And, and there's usually some common threads that that um, that are found in the in the things that you're really passionate about or things you're most proud of. So it's a it's a good uh, it's a good way to channel your energy. This edition of Lions Live is called the New Creators Toolkit. Was there anything you heard that surprised you or, or made you think differently? Mm. Well, yeah, th there's a lot of talk this year about purpose, right? And uh, you see a lot of brands talking about, like, you've got to find your purpose and do your purpose. And what that often translates to is, like, a big boring manifesto that nobody cares about except for the people in the, in the boardroom, you know? So, you know, every creative is going to be tasked with that sort of brief over the next 
you know, year or so of like, we, we want to do something purposeful. Um, there's a talk from Uber about actions, not ads. We've, that's a phrase we've heard, you know, a lot over the last year, but really important to remember that sometimes those actions cost you something. And that's, that's where you find out where your values are. Um, Uber brought up a great example at the beginning of the pandemic during lockdown, they did spots that, that told people not to ride, you know, don't move, which is kind of not what their shareholders would have loved for them to say, but it, it was the right message. And in the long run, that's, that's the, the right thing to do. So one really interesting way to think about purpose, if, if you're creating stuff, is it doesn't often come from a, a message or a manifesto piece, but it's, it's often a byproduct of an action or an observation. So like a good example of this is, is the idea of unity, because that's a theme I've been hearing a lot about uh, in the media, like, you know, trying to bring people together, super important, but you're not really going to create unity by doing a spot that says we should be united. Unity is a byproduct of an action. Like it's a feeling you create by doing something or by bringing people together in a way that's not just saying we should be together. So I think that's a, that's a really good thing to learn is often, you know, our purpose is more effective as a byproduct of an action or a, or a feeling you create, not just going out and stating your purpose. And finally, what are your thoughts on creating a creative culture, especially in the context of what's happened over the past year? Everybody's working um, yeah. very differently. Well, it, it's it's been a really um, challenging time for a lot of people, a lot of agencies. I will say for us, we started in a pandemic. I have never met half the people, more than half the people I work with in real life, but we've never been. I've never been closer to some human beings because we are constantly in contact with each other, you know, um, and that's what you have to do. I, I, I know it's painful and la one last thing we need is another Zoom, but there are other ways to contact with people. And what I think is really important to keep in mind is don't just meet with people when it's on your calendar, because what we're really missing are these uh, in, quote unquote inconsequential meetings that happen in the office where you just bump into somebody. It's your, it's your, um, informal network basically which is people you don't have on your calendar don't have schedule with you but try to try to reach out to those people text whatever just go back and forth reach out have no agenda or schedule a meeting with absolutely no agenda and just have people kind of chat and talk or or hang out 10 minutes after the time is off because that's usually where the fun interesting stuff goes i think right now we've kind of gotten to this zone where we're moving from one block of time to the next block of time to the next block of time. We need to shake that up, it, you know, sort of like go a little more freestyle with our time because um, I think we're all married to the notifications and the and the uh, the blocks of time that formal conversations take place in. We need to we need to shake that up a little bit. Some really useful advice there. Thank you, Greg, so much for all of your insights, for your time, and for engaging with all of today's content. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you for having me. All of, it, all of it is available on demand as well on the Lions Live platform. We'll also be sharing all of the live Q&As as soon as we can, so do keep a lookout for those too. A big thank you to all of you for your questions, for your comments, for your shares. Please do keep chatting to us on our social channels. We will be back here at 1pm GMT tomorrow for more inspiring content to help sharpen up your creative toolkit. We'll look at how to find your virtual voice with Caroline Goida and how to navigate your creative career through technical creativity with Elizabeth Barron. You'll see the Lion's Guide to Modern Storytelling and we'll hear from the CMOs of L'Oreal and Microsoft. I'm Tina Dahili, this is Lions Live and here's a sneak peek of what's coming up tomorrow. My belief was that we were not doing digital marketing, but we were doing marketing at the digital age. All this week, we're putting CMOs in the spotlight at Lions Live. What does it mean to have information presented to you in context volumetrically, visually, with other senses, within a globally connected team. 
let's go.